Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, panel 4A, which is on biotech capitalism and biopolitics, and I'll be chairing today's session. Um, so, uh, as always, we're going to do the three papers first and then uh, go to Q&A. So uh, please leave any questions that you have for our panelists in either in the chat or um, you can raise your hand in the Q&A at the end and I'll come to you um, and you can either quest uh, pose your question verbally or I'll read out your, your question. Okay, so with, without further ado, I'll introduce our first um, speaker, who is Jana Vanasek. So um, Jana was born in the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic and lives currently in Switzerland. She holds degrees in fine arts, critical theory and transdisciplinarity in the arts. She works as a research associate at the Zurich University of Arts. As an artist and writer, her projects operate at the interfaces between art, research, science and literature. Vanasek often chooses her topics on the basis of, pers of uh, personal, but the focus is not on her individual person. She sees herself rather as a contact area or bioport in which the prevailing discourses and practices are brought, to, are brought together. Inspired by Gloria Anzaldúa's poetic auto theory and Annie Erno's auto ethnographic literature, the writing self is decentralized in her texts in order to reveal the cultural, political, economic, and social entanglements that shape this self, but also the social realities of many other lives. Vanasek illuminates her topics from different disciplinary perspectives and uses a combination of diverse voices as a structuring principle. And uh, the paper title today is, uh, I don't know how I'm going to really say this, ID 9606 forward slash 2AC uh, Genealogien eines Virus. So thank you very much, Jana, and uh, I'll pass the floor over to you now. Okay. Hi, I'm Jana. I'm a white woman. I have blonde hair, green eyes, and I'm wearing a white shirt. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me. I will first give a brief introduction to the subject and then continue right away by reading an excerpt from the manuscript. Introduction. Due to the rapid developments in the field of medical biotechnology, the transactions that are connected with the body have developed into the most important areas of the market economy in the last few decades. This has led to massive changes in political, economic and social structures, but also to new power relations between the institutions and social classes involved. With the methods of artistic research, my upcoming book addresses the questions of how biotechnological inventions as eras of capitalist investments can affect political decision in healthcare. The reference point of my investigation is the rationing of the new, new hepatitis C drugs in Switzerland. I am assuming a personal experience, my infection with the hepatitis C virus. For a long time, the infection was considered impossible to treat or only treatable to a very limited extent. This fact only changed when Pharmacet developed the cure, cure, which was brought to market by Gilead Science a few years later. The possibility of an all, almost 100% chance of recovery has been celebrated as a historic event in science and medicine. But while Gilead was able to run an unrivaled business with the new hepatitis C drugs for a long time, the miracle of healing remained out of reach for most of those affected. The therapies were simply too expensive. ID 9690-2AC, Genealogies of a Virus. It was three years after the fall of the Berlin Wall when my physician announced the result to me. On the one hand, a very large part of the world, which I had to consider a no-go zone for years, had opened its borders to me. 
I was now allowed to enter the territory of the former Soviet Union and its satellite states with impunity. In Switzerland, however, the borders seem to close more and more. The effects of the assimilation regime of the, 90s, uh, of the 1970s and the 1980s were still being felt and would continue to intensify. Although it had been over 20 years since James Schwarzenbach initiative has been rejected, it had changed Swiss migration policy forever. Schwarzenbach was the owner of the publishing house Thomas Verlag, which published fascist, folkish, and anti-Semitic writings. In the National Council, he represented the Zurich section of the National Action Against the Alienation of People and Homeland. His role as a pioneer of European right-wing populism can certainly tra be traced back to his initiative on Überfremdung, which means access of foreigners. That was put to the vote in June 1970. His referendum set the record with a 75% turnout, whereby 45% 40, of the voters supported Schwarzenbach's proposal. The proposal, if executed, would have required the Swiss government to limit immigrant workers in Switzerland to 10%. This would have resulted in the deportation of up to 300,000 immigrants. Although the referendum was not passed, the number of available work permits decreased. Not only far-right supporters had approved the referendum, but even then the support extended far into the social democratic camp. Before the Swiss People's Party took up the immigration issue, in the late 1980s and made xenophobia a driving force of its rise, three other initiatives on excessive immigration had to come to a vote in Switzerland. At about the same time that Schwarzenbach was trying to preserve Swiss identity with his Überfremdungsinitiative, Microbiologist Ananda Mohan Chakrabarti had created a new species through genetic recombination and molecular cloning. By modifying an existing bacterial strain with circular, autonomously replicating double-stranded DNA molecules from another bacterial strain, Chakrabarti had created a new organism with the ability to break down crude oil into simpler substances that can serve as food for aquatic life. Chakrabarti applied for a patent on his microorganism in 1972 and was initially rejected. However, however, changes in the political economic climate eventually led the United States Supreme Court to update the meaning of patent laws. Since Chakrabarti's bacterium was genetically modified and thus no longer identical to the original organism, thus did not occur in this form in nature, and also otherwise met all the requirements for, for patent law, the United States Supreme Court ruled in 1980 that new life forms fall under the jurisdiction of federal, federal patent law and made this genetically modified living being a patentable product. My diagnosis came 12 years later, in 1992. I was 16 years old when the RT-PCR confirmed my status as a registrable host of the hepatitis C virus, genotype 2AC. The Californian genetic engineering company responsible for the discovery of the long sought pathogen had already filed a patent application for the virus in 1987. And GenBank, now one of the three largest DNA sequences databases, already had over 55 million DNA base pairs stored. While the dispositive that we now call the biotechnological industry had long since influenced various developments in medicine, 
with the scientific and technological possibilities of genetic engineering, cloning, and recombinant DNA, the national action against the alienation of people and homeland was experiencing a new high under its new name, Swiss Democrats. Although my physician drew on the latest technologies for analysis, his way of thinking, seeing, and practicing was shaped by a complex of discourses and practices established with the emergence of modern nation states. His clinical gaze fed on the notion of a self-contained and delimitable body that could be formed and parceled out through disciplinary techniques of power. He was still too caught up in the idea that agency was a purely human quality and that only human beings could be considered social actors. With this view, however, he was no exception. In 1992, few could have guessed that a new level of intervention would establish itself below the classical biopolitical poles of individual and population which characterized by molecularization and digitalization would operate both within and beyond bodily boundaries. Until that day, I understood my body as a composition of limbs, organs, tissues, bloodstreams, and hormones. The self-understanding of my bodily materiality, the corporeality of the subject, was also shaped by the age of clinical medicine. Of course, I had been aware that 40 years earlier, James Watson and Francis Crick had created a spatial model of the DNA double helix based on the X-ray diffraction data of Rosalind Franklin. But the notion of a molecular body or a thought style in which the concept of the individual disappeared completely or remained hidden by a focus on cellular and molecular interactions was unthinkable to me. This had not only to do with the fact that I had neither the knowledge <clears throat> nor the access to the necessary technologies <clears throat> that would have given me the privilege of such a partial perspective. Apart from that, a model of the living world, including the world of humans, which does not even require the hypothesis of the human person, was at that time still dreams of the future, even for science. At the time of my first contact with PCR, I had absolutely no idea that this could be a mutation of the type of power taking place before my eyes a power that was closely related to new forms of knowledge and no longer used as a clinical and no longer used a clinical but a molecular gaze of my body a body whose dissection and recombination by means of biotechnologies was not understood by me but whose molecular rearticulation still has lasting still has a lasting impact on my view of biopolitical problems. Today, almost 30 years later, biomedicine visualizes life differently. Life is understood in terms of the properties and transposition of coding sequences of nucleotide bases and their variation that regulate molecular mechanism involving gene expression and transcription. Moreover, it can be claimed today that biomedicine and especially genetics compared to the revolution in physics probably holds the greater potential for reshaping society and life. This paradigm shift, however, will demand the rejection of the humanistic notion of man as the measure of all things and the center of all discursive and social practices. It will confront the humanities with unimagined problems of an ethical, political nature. On the day of my diagnosis, my thought style also slowly started to mutate, so to speak. The physician had explained to me 
what the reverse transcriptase, a genotype, and the PCR are. And my viruses seem to mutate so quickly due to a very high error rate in their RNA-dependent polymerases that they produce extremely many variants of themselves. These mutants, these so-called quasi-species, help the virus evade the body's immune response and represented one reason why not only I, but many other people developed chronic hepatitis C. Without question, I had arrived in the molecular age in one fell swoop, an age in which life understood as genetic material can be sequenced, stored as FASTA code, stored in biobanks or cultivated in stem cell lines and is not subjected to the same biological rhythms as the organic body. An age in which biology is no longer considered a discovery science that registers, documents, and orders life processes, but is understood as a transformation science that can actively change living beings. An age in which molecules and life processes are patented and technological progress in medicine had already changed social identities, created new forms of political association and constantly opened up new circuits of capital. The term individual became obsolete for me, but this was not only due to the fact that my blood was infectious, the viruses, these 50 nanometer large hackers in my blood became, so to speak, my teachers. They showed me through their presence and activity that my body is not a self-contained monad, not an organic substrate, but rather a text that can be read and rewritten. A text that is not simply a hardware that can be modulated, but rather a molecular software whose processes can be reprogrammed. A text that is always connected to other molecular softwares, even when they are not human animals. But it was not the viruses alone that were to dissolve the epistemic and normative boundaries between humans and non-humans for me and established in me a different understanding of the relationship between life and death. It was the modern biotechnological practices that were to determine my everyday life sometime later. Practices that expanded and continuously shifted the knowledge of biopolitical interventions inscribed in the body. Through to the years as a viral symbol, I was always in the midst of reprogrammings. One of these reprogrammings seemed to represent a new form of capitalism. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. I thought it was fascinating how you brought in your own uh, experience as a methodology, and I'm sure we can talk about that at the, a bit more in the Q&A at the end. Thanks so much. Um, okay, so um, I'll move on to our next speaker, uh, Maria Diaz. Um, so Maria uh, Francisca Diaz is an MA English-speaking cultures student at the University of Bremen. Her main fields of research are literature, gender studies, autobiographic narratives, and science fiction. And uh, the paper title today is Juana e, e la Cibernetica, Insanity or Cybernetics. So thank you very much, uh, Maria. The floor is yours. Thank you. Can, can you see my, my screen? Yes. Yes? Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you for that introduction. Um, yes, today I will be talking to you about uh, Juana y la Cibernetica, a short story written by Elena Aldunate. And this is the outline of the presentation for today. So first the introduction, of course. Then we, I will be talking about the main character, who is Juana. So Juana and society, and then Juana and silence and loneliness, then Juana and the machine, and then the conclusion. Okay, so um, 
Juana de la Cibernética was written by Elena Dunate during the golden age of science fiction in Chile, which encompasses the years 1959 to 1975. And Pizarro and Rupert Hoots highlight that Aldunate's work illustrates the changes in Chilean literature and society during the second half of the 20th century. According to Darren Lockhart, there are a few recurring topics in Aldunate's works. For instance, she emphasized the need of communication among her characters who break barriers of time, space, and species to achieve it. And communication is the means to overcome the loneliness and in which some of her characters lives. Live, sorry. In this sense, Juana la Cibernética tells the story of a working woman in her 40s who finds herself locked in in the machine where she oversees a machine that cuts sink planks as part of an assembly production. While in there, she starts thinking about what her life has been like and gives full freedom to her mind, empowering herself through hallucinations. This paper sheds light on the protagonist's actions through a close reading, analyzing the hints the narration gives to portray her mental state, which is influenced by her solitude and by the pressure she felt from a diurnal and patriarchal society. So let's go to number two. Juana and society. So Juana is just another worker in the factory owned by Mr. Wellman. Mostly women work there operating different machines in a production assembly line. In words of the narrator, Mr. Wellman decided to build bathrooms inside the big machine rooms so he could maintain his workers under control. This phrase represents somehow the way in which workers used to be treated like and still are in some cases, Foreign businesses have been part of Chile's society until current times, been one of the most neoliberal countries in the world nowadays. Uh, parenthesis, recent of the uprising in, 19, in 2019. According to Mar Marcos Arcaya, this working woman, Juana, serves as a symbol of the marginalization of the dispossessed, of the exploited. In this sense, she evokes the use, he evokes she evokes the, uh, the use of an archetype related to Juan of the eighth part of the Canto General by Neruda. The Earth's name is Juan. So Arcaya suggests that marginalization is highlighted in Juana y la Cibernética precisely in a woman, reminding us to, uh, of what has been called the feminization of the poverty, term coined by Diana Pierce. Juana represents one of those unskilled workers that entered an open and precarious system where the woman's work is monotonous and does not demand imagination in words of, of Juana in this case. The narration, the narration gives certain hints that makes the reader understand that Juana is not only not financially self-sufficient and she has low self-esteem, but she's also oppressed by the system and in consequence consequence by her own thoughts. For example, always working, always living as a non-renter at, at Aunt Luchas, postponed, badly dressed on the fringe of the existent, on of the travels and the joys of the rest of the people. Then we have silence and loneliness. So Juana is trapped in this factory where she has been working for two years. At the beginning, she tries to make her be heard, but nobody answers back. All that she hears back is silence. She looks up for someone who could help her, but nothing. This factory, which happens to be a four-story building, serves to represent a space that will become her dwelling for three days and subsequently her tomb. According to Gilbert Durand, a home is an end time symbol which determines the personality of the dweller. And this new environment in which Juana is staying goes through a transformation in her eyes. From being the factory where she works, it becomes her own place, her home, where she can finally be free from everything and everyone's expectations and can go through a self-discovery process where she finds herself with her nocturnal self. Juana is surrounded by silence. That situation makes her uncomfortable. And I quote, what bothered her was the silence. Silence, that was the worst, end quote. 
The omniscient narrator introduces the reader to Juana's thoughts and one can understand her economical and personal situation. For example, she rents a small room and has nobody. Also, the narrator reveals that Juana has served, has never met a male body in the intimacy. She is slowly in a patriarchal society that does not care about her. Silence makes the protagonist think about her life, about her monotonous and boring life, and about passages that happened years before, which reveal certain personality traits that help understand her future actions. She questions the fact that of all of her workers, or all of the other workers in their factory, the incident happened, and I quote, to her, to her who lives alone, to her who at her 44 years had not yet known the love, the man, end quote. She continuously remarks that she's alone and that she's, it is a relief somehow that she's there because she has, and I quote, nothing to lose and nobody would miss her, end quote. She feels alien to this place, to the factory, although she has been working there for two years and she has to take tranquilizer tablets uh, because she wants to sleep and that the time passes. After one night, when she wakes up for, from that forced sleep, she starts walking around the machines, knowing that this is familiar to her somehow. And I quote, her steps moved by the daily routine drive her to her workplace, to her machine, and, end quote. She continues making her, this place her place, looking at the machines and thinking about movies and other apparent trivialities. Little by little, the protagonist starts feeling more comfortable in that space where she can eat and drink water, <laughs> of course, she didn't have any food, and fantasize as if she was at her actual home. The bathrooms are in the machine rooms, so Juana decides to take a shower. Finally, uh, she will have time to take a long and lazy bath, just as she has dreamt so many times. And this part is a pivotal moment, the turning point, the transformation process of the setting, because it is in this moment where she can recognize and enjoy herself while looking at her reflection in the mirrors. And I quote, as she passes large mirrors, she contemplates herself. She never does this when she's naked. The mirror shows her a thin woman, a bit angular, white, too wide, the waist somewhat thick, raising her arms just as she would see in a French movie. She puts her short hair onto her neck, neck and sleepy coquetry surrounds her." End quote. Gilbert Durand asserts that the mirror is not only part of the process of reflecting self-images and subsequently a symbol of the tenebrous duplication of the consciousness, but it is also linked to coquetry. Uh, moreover, water is the original mirror. And waters are deep feminine symbols because the archetype of the aquatic and the evil is the menstrual blood. Water is also consciousness. Water can contain objects and depending if the water is running or stagnant, it will have different meanings. In the case of the shower Juan is taking, it can show a way of movement and therefore change into her primal self. Durant also quotes Bachelard about the Ophelia complex, where looking at oneself, in a mirror is already to affiliate oneself. And in the case of Juana, it could be that what starts to happen when she looks at herself the first time, and then after the shower where, and I quote, um, the warm water runs caressly, caressingly over her skin, over her face, her hair, her hands, her shoulders, orphaned of male fingers, over her small, still hard breasts, over her pointed hips, over her tired legs. With a white he head of foam, she goes out to look at herself in the mirrors again. Before these, she makes crazy hairstyles. Then, sleepwalking, she walks through around the room naked and soaked. What a wonderful feeling. So finally, she can feel something. Um, in this sense, one can see that Juana has liberated herself after drinking water, after taking a shower, and after looking at herself in the mirror which is also water in a way. She's being comfortable with her naked body and in this space that went from being the factory where she works in precarious conditions to the place where she can walk without clothes. Moreover, her factory is also full of noises that she enjoys and the silence is not a problem anymore due to the machines are working nonstop thanks to her. And I quote, how many are the moving machines? Only three, not, you must turn them all on, 
all of them. She wants heat, noise, a lot of noise, a lot of life, end quote. Mainly because Juana believes that silence is fear, solitude, and vigil. This next day, also she flushes the tranquilizer tablets down the toilets. She doesn't need them anymore, according to her, because she is now with a lot of familiar sounds. Now, Juana and the machine. Juana has a lively imagination. Juana is a person who has already talked with her colleagues about the idea of machines being intelligent and able to rebel against their masters, but always with a sense of fear of them. And I quote, one day the machines will rebel against their masters. Machines will no longer need them and will have initiatives. The rising of machines, thousand times faster, more precise and safer than the human hands and eyes, producers, produces work, work, unemployment, working unemployment, end quote. Juana recalls these thoughts and starts feeling that maybe the machines have eyes and hearts, just like humans do. And I quote, suddenly she feels she's being looked at, that many pairs of eyes observe her, end quote. Although this time she feels this way, she's not afraid of the machines and needs them to feel comfortable because of the noise they make when they're functioning. How absurd, How, why will you be afraid of them? It's iron feet and are bolted to the ground. They cannot walk, she says. In this regard, the protagonist not only turns on the entire factory machines, but also approaches her machine. She knows this machine, she knows its movements and knows how fast it goes. So she starts playing with it in an erotic manner, completely forgetting everything else. And I quote, Standing before the machine, she fixes her eyes on it, and an irresistible attraction forces her to touch it more closely. The machine comforts her. It's the only familiar thing in her abandonment. And the game begins. Fingers under the thin, thick, piercing plunger. Juana smiles. With each movement of the machine, she's faster, much faster. There is an advantage that the machine will not, that it cannot go faster. Therefore, she will always win. It always goes up and down to the right, to the left, and her pale hands are always faster. The heat of friction gives the steel warm contact, the repetition of the movement, a rhythmic gasp, oil gears that rotate, meet, separate, meet, separate, end quote. In this moment, one can start thinking about the cyborg of Donna Haraway. Juana plays with the machine and eventually has a final sexual encounter with it which can be interpreted as different outcomes depending on the view. If one thinks under a diurnal and patriarchal view, one can believe that this final encounter is suicide rather than sex, because this lady could not fulfill the requirements for a successful life of the society at that time. At the same time, if one starts thinking under a nocturnal view, um, one can say that Juana liberated herself and that her apparent death is just another part of her feminine cycle. But also, if one thinks under Haraway's views, one can actually give this final encounter another meaning. In this sense, Grace Martin in 2015 states that Juana is a Hawaiian cyborg. Because by breaking taboos regarding female sexuality, she purposely stares at her naked body and enjoys it. She begins seeking erotic pleasure without shame, both in things, little, taking a shower, and big, stimulating herself with the aid of an industrial robot. Eventually, she consciously lets herself die, torn apart by her machine, for the sake of experiencing the ultimate, most climatic mixture of pain and pleasure. Apparently, Juana is fed up with everything, and she's hungry in her body and in her mind. And I quote, an atrocious sleepy hunger, an almost forgotten need, an emptiness, permanent pain. However, she no longer thinks about eating or what she would like to eat. No, she, this is a prosaic hunger, hunger for life, power, redemption, end quote. Therefore, she needs to satiate this hunger somehow. She feels the need of liberating herself from her own guilt and her self-pity. And this accident of being trapped in the factory is an opportunity for her liberation, for this cyborg to appear, where just as Haraway states, and I quote, the cyborg is a condensed image of both imagination and material reality. The two joint centers structuring any possibility of historical transformation. End quote. On one hand, 
One has the imaginative and curious mind of Juana, and on the other, the material reality, the machine, which merge and make the protagonist forget every single lived experience in exchange of liberation and silence. Um, finally, the conclusion. Um, this paper tried to answer the question regarding the protagonist's state of mind and to what extent she portrays mental disturbance while connecting herself with the machine. Um, Chilean post-colonial society influenced Juana's behavior, and it has been stated that the post-colonial, diurnal, and patriarchal society of those times influenced in her low self-esteem and in the way she perceived herself being poor and lonely. There was a transformation of the setting, which became to be the protagonist's dwelling for three days, in which she encountered herself after a moment of self-recognition with her nocturnal self in silence, and then in the middle of the machine room with non-stop movement and noise. Finally, depending on the lenses one looks at the resolution of the story, it will have different op opinions. One will have different opinions about it. It was suicide she liberated herself or she became a cyborg. Thank you very much. And um, that's my bibliography. Brilliant, thanks so much, Maria. That was fantastic. And I'm sure we can talk about that, uh, that ending during the Q&A as well. Um, Thank you. Right, so I'm gonna move on to our third speaker of the day, uh, which is Margarita Swana. Um, so uh, Margarita Sauna studied linguistics and literature at Pontific, uh, Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú. Sorry for my pronunciation. She received a PhD in Latin American literature from Columbia University in New York. She's interested in issues of memory, cognition, empathy and representation in literature and the arts. She has published numerous articles, two books on literary and cultural criticism, Novelas Familiares, Figuraciones de la Nación en la Novela Latinoamericana Contemporana um, by Rosiero Press in 2004 and Memory Matters in Transitional Peru, uh, London 2014. Two books of short fiction, Come Horas, 2008, and Objeto Perdido, 2012, and a book of poems, Corazón de... Jalata, Tin Heart, 2017. She's currently working on two books, one entitled Despadre, La Masculinidad y la Crisis de la Identidad en la Cultura Peruana, which examines the way representations of men in Peruvian literature and film reveal deep fractures in the country's imaginary, and another one entitled Vital Signs on the Literary Genres of Infirmity. And Margarita's paper title for uh, today is An Aesthetic Response, Mind and Senses in Literary Works by Women Patients. Thank you very much, Margarita. Thanks so much, Ben. Uh, um, well, I also want to thank the, my co-panelists because I, I don't think I speak quite about, you know, um, biomedical issues, um, but but I think they were fascinating and there's so much to talk about, uh, perhaps not, a, not related necessarily to my piece, but to other things that I'm interested in. So I'm grateful I got to, to listen to you. Um, and so let me share my screen. Um, so in the, the title that I gave for the program, my, my signs for how, what to do with this world were not correct, but I decided for this slash um, in this anesthetic response, mind and senses in literary works by women patients. Um, so I, I had put parentheses on the end, but I think I rather, what I want to address is the issue of, of um, anesthesia as, as trying to you know, prevent pain uh, versus uh, anesthetic uh, of illness in which we embrace 
the sensations that come with it, even when these sensations are negative. <clears throat> and it's not that I'm against anesthesia, it's just that I'm, it's, it's, I want to think about both things, the, the relief of pain uh, and how also perhaps writing for some people is a way to relieve pain too. Or for people going uh, through health-related experiences, and sometimes even those who treat them, often reject the term patient because they associate it with being passive. I purposefully embrace this term in its etymological sense. In its Latin origin, as derived from patients from patio to suffer or bear. The women whose works I examine here have experienced extreme suffering and often an enduring confrontation with their own mortality. And their writings reflect distinct ways in which the written word responds to the bodily estrangements caused by illness. On the one hand, illness is a sensorial phenomenon. Changes in temperature, pain in all its different manifestations, and often visual, olfactory, hearing, and taste disturbances. Illness is an aesthetic experience. If we go back to the Greek origin of the word aesthetikos, meaning of or for the perception by the senses. Illness awakens our senses, often in undesirable ways. Its symptoms make it impossible to ignore what we perceive. And this aesthetic experience has been translated into poetry, um, essays, um, and other forms of writing by many authors. On the other hand, Illness creates a cognitive dissonance that makes the sufferers search for ways to understand why their bodies act in unexpected ways, to question the idea of normalcy or the self, um, like we saw in Jana's um, talk, right? and to inquire into the medical responses to their pain. Writers often search in, their, in the history of their illness and its treatment, the philosophical aspects of suffering, the fragility of life, the meaning of medical terms, and the limits of the self. In her 1926 essay on being ill, um, Virginia Woolf wonders at the fact that illness had not been, in her view, a prominent literary topic. In the last couple of decades, critics such as Susanna Mintz, Thomas Kusser, and others have demonstrated how far from true Woolf's impression was. However, her brief essay does shed light on many, on what many, um, including patient writers, see as their biggest challenge, finding the right language to communicate extreme body experiences that seem to trump words themselves, and that led her to believe that, um, and I quote, save for one or two passions, such as desire and greed, the body is for literature null, negligible, Non -ex or, and non-existent. In her essay, Wolf creates metaphors to describe what is to be a human being as an embodied experience. The creature within can only gaze through the pain, smudged or rosy. It cannot separate off from the body like the sheath of a knife or the pot of a pea for a single instant. However, the experience of illness shoves us into a dualistic rabbit hole when we suffer the assault of fever, sorry, the assault of fever or the oncome of melancholia. So the experience of the body in pain risks us making us, and I quote her words, taper into mysticism or rise with rapid beats of the wings into the raptures of transcendentalism. We need, she says, not only a new language to talk about illness, but a new hierarchy of passions. The way Wolf describes the experience of being sick brings forth an awakening of perceptions and senses that cannot be expressed through a sentence like, I'm in bed with influenza, that's what she says. And then she wonders, what does that convey of the great experience? How the world has changed its shape the tools of business grown remote, 
the sounds of festival become romantic, like a merry-go-round heard across park fields. And friends have changed, some putting on a strange beauty, others deformed to the squadness of toes, while the whole landscape of life lies remote and fair, like the shore scene from the ship far out at sea, and he is now exalted on a peak. Wolf claims that prose cannot properly deal with illness because she says we cannot command all our faculties and keep our reason and our judgment and our memory at attention, while poetry allows for a different way to convey experience. And she says, we break off a line or two and let them open in the depths of the mind, spread their wings, swim like color fish in green waters. I do argue that illness is an aesthetic experience, an experience of the senses, but it is also a cognitive experience. And writing, as demonstrated by the many different manifestations it offers, is a way of processing emotions, sensations, and conceptual cognitive processes. While the incommunicability of pain has been amply discussed, new studies such as Elite Ferrer 2019's book on pain and the origin of language present the idea that when pain encounters language, it tears it apart, and in doing so, it lays bare its very essence. While Susan Sontag's illness as metaphor has been extremely influential, it also has many critics who rise up in defense of metaphors as an important form of expression for those trying to speak about their embodied experience, and even as a way for medical professionals to approach patients' treatment if they can pay attention to what the patients are saying. Kenneth Sherman, a poet recovering from cancer, offers an important insight into Sontag's brilliantly analytic essay, commenting on her restraint and objectivity toward her subject, having been a cancer patient uh, herself. Sherman reminds us that illness and metaphor had been written after Sontag's treatments had ended, as reported by her own diaries, and later her son David Reeves' memoir confirms this fact. Sherman believes that the time she waited to write, and he, he says, allowed her to distance herself from an experience she found excruciatingly painful. However, I believe that there was also a gendered impulse in her uh, chosen style of writing. As an established critic and an important public figure during the height of second wave feminism, her choice of a highly rational and unsentimental approach was perhaps the only way to be considered a serious intellectual and not a, her quotes, a woman a writer. In contrast, the subjective turn of the present time has produced a large number of autopathographies, to use Coser's term, or personal stories of illness that embrace in their prose both the analytical and the aesthetic. I would like to offer a few insights into one of the most notable of those texts, Susan Gubar's Memoir of a Devolved Woman. Gubar, whose seminal work in collaboration with Sandra Gilbert, The Mad Woman in the Attic, marked a new era of feminist literary criticism, is also an established critic at the time of the publication of her memoir. Unlike uh, Sontag's, her book, weaves the personal into a scholarly and analytic investigation into ovarian cancer. Beautifully written and at times poetic, it nonetheless blurs over the motivation for writing the book. In the foreword, Gubar uh, explains what she calls, and I quote, a compulsion to relate my encounter with the seas as one of the driving forces um, for her writing. Um, because she suspected that others might have similar experiences, even if her seem anon anomalous. She states, sorry, um, she states, my central motive consists of a fierce belief that something must be done to rectify the miserable inadequacies of current medical response to ovarian cancer. 
However, the next line confesses, and I quote, the composition of this narrative kept me sane during a hard time. The impulse to write is not single, but double. On the one hand, the altruistic idea to impact others and even the medical profession through the telling of one's story. And on the other hand, the personal need to engage with writing. For an intellectual like her, researching, thinking, and writing about a topic is also a way to cope. Um, I do not have uh, time in the presentation to discuss the utilitarian and therapeutic use of writing, but those are issues I would like to explore further sometime. And, and here it comes the, the anesthetic uh, idea, not that, the, that um, writing as palliative that we can talk about too. I also lack the time to devote this talk to the beauty and insight that I find in these illness essays by Wolf, Sontag, and Guber. But I would like to point out the fact that Guber's book combines passages of personal journals written during her different treatments, so at the time of, she was writing at the time of the illness, with accounts elaborated a posteriori, and sections written almost in the style of uh, scientific journalism. Although poetry is perhaps more explicit in bringing to the fore the aesthetic experience in dealing with the pain and suffering of illness, poets activate their senses but also the mental effort that requires adapting to a new situation. Receiving a diagnosis and having to adjust to the medical lingo associated with it, for example, presents a demanding cognitive challenge. I find that poets respond to illness addressing a number of topics that have to do with understanding their disease, the strangeness of the language used to describe it, the shock of the diagnosis, the body dysmorphia caused by bodily change challenges and the heightened awareness of the physical world. We can see how some of those responses come to light in Leila Chatty's poem, Sarcoma, from her 2020 book, Peluche. Sarcoma, when the doctor says the word sarcoma, I consider how it might be a nice name for a daughter, the good feminine A, the way parents name their children for all sorts of inappropriate things, apples, for instance, or the place where the baby was conceived. And I trace my fingers over the barrow of my belly as she speaks, flesh distended beneath the blue tissue I wear for a dress, an ideal grief frog throwaway. And he says something about life expectancy, but of course I expect my life so plain I thought nothing would ever take it that while he explains, I cup my palms around my center as if comforting a child or covering her ears. The diagnosis becomes a sound devoid of meaning, sarcoma, and the patient experiences difficulties to understand what the doctor is saying, the estrangements of the term life expectancy, for example. While denial is activated as a defense mechanism and her mind wanders, her touch explores the shape of her belly, the texture of the examining gown, while the words are threatening noise. In Linda Semorain's Matrix Lux, where a Kundalini healing mantra starts each page, that the construction of medical terminology leads to new understandings of medical treatment. Prama, da, sa, sa, se, so, hon, transfusion, two bloods that fuse and clarify the prodigy, to be another in the blood of another. Transfusion, translucent fusion with an anonymous body. The wordplay with a technical term for injecting another person's blood into one's bloodstream leads the poet to the realization of the human connection established by the medical procedure. And here we can also go to to Jana's idea of the, the demolishing this individual self, right? The brief linguistic analysis of the word gives transcendence to the experience. The multiplicity of media also facilitates, um, sorry, the, and I want to go to a different screen now. 
because I'm not sure my other link is going to work. Thank you. The multiplicity of new media also facilitates other forms in which the sufferer, sufferers venture into aesthetic explorations of their pain. I would like to recommend as an example, Laura, uh, Laura Donald's blog, Hearty Tales, where she creates scenes and artifacts around the topic of heart failure. Uh, it's called uh, Hearty Tales, Stories of a Chronic Heart Disease. And as you can see from her many entries, she invites readers to contribute haikus, but also um, does you know, some other things um, like, like, you know, uh, give instructions of how to create these exploding books and um, kind of playful things. I do not want to romanticize illness. I am not saying your illness is a blessing uh, that has made you truly appreciate life or everything happens for a reason. But illness does shake up your consciousness and sense of self and removes us from the land of the healthy from our daily routines and experiences and from what Viktor Shklosky called automatization. I quote Shklosky here. This is how life becomes nothing and disappears in his famous art as device essay. Um, Shklosky says, automatization eats things, clothes, furniture, your wife, and even the fear of war. The disruption of the of routine, the alienation brought about by illness is painful and possibly devastating. But by bringing our bodies and the physical world into sight, by forcing patients and caregivers to learn new languages, by presenting the challenge of symptoms and diagnosis to feel and understand, infirmity is in all its forms, sorry, Infirmity in all its forms has the potential of the kind of estrangement manifested in essays, insightful autopathographies, and lyrical poetry. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thanks so much. Um, we've got uh, half an hour now for, for questions. So i um, uh, just going to have a look at the uh, chat to see whether um, anyone's got any questions in the chat. So um, as per usual, like if you've got questions, you can either put your hand up and ask them yourself or write them in the chat and, um, and then I will read them out. Okay, well, I think I've, I've got a question to start off with. Um, my question's actually for, for Jana. Um, uh, you were talking, I was really interested in what you were, you were saying about the body as a text uh, that can be read, read, written and, and rewritten. And the, the body is a text that's always kind of in communion with other texts and, and stuff like that. I was just, this is a very like self-centered question because I work on Malibu, but I was just wondering whether you'd read the work of Catherine Malibu on, um, on biology. And she talks about the kind of hermeneutics of the body and the body as, as text and the kind of hermeneutics between, between different bodies. Uh, I, I unfortunately, I don't know Catherine Malibu, but uh, I came to this idea because of uh, my viruses or what viruses actually do. Uh, I was kind of trying to write like a virus. And so I was studying how viruses write. So they, they enter the cell, they reprogram it, they rewrite it and the cell produces this uh, these new viruses or like when, when it's um, this uh, like HIV, when, when, when it makes this, uh, the, the DNA reverse kind of transcription, I found that totally interesting. And, and sometimes they even do combine like different species, like still viruses, but they are combining together with, uh, I don't know if it's gene shift or so, and I found that totally interesting, yeah. And because these viruses were with me like for 30 years mm -hmm. and uh, this, this had made something to my body, of course, and it, it is a different uh, bodily feeling without them. 
And uh, I was kind of really fascinated at frightened, but also very fascinated. That's brilliant. Yeah, like, I, I don't know, it's, it's interesting how, because uh, I, I guess Malibu's coming at it from a very different uh, perspective. She's, I guess, trying to, hmm, what is she trying to do? Yeah, I, I guess for, for Malibu, like the body is always in transformation and the body is kind of auto interpreting itself and like auto um, kind of like uh, auto hermeneutic, I, I guess. So like, and, and I guess one of the questions that I've always had about uh, Malibu is, is it possible to kind of let the body speak without without uh, us kind of like writing for the body and and uh, kind of imposing a narrative on the body. So with you and your this your writing and your writing like a virus, um, do you think? I mean, what do you think about that question? Do you think that it is possible to to kind of let allow a virus to speak or or to have the body speak in a way that is kind of unimpeded by I don't know the conscious mind or or conscious writing or something like that. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of difficult because uh, I, I somehow tried it in, in different texts. But uh, when I resumed this text, I always somehow an anthropomorphized the viruses. And I think it, this doesn't work, actually, because they are writing differently. But uh, I saw them always as co-writers. Yeah. Uh, even to the point that I was actually afraid that uh, my writing will change when they are gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because I had to kind of imagine this like uh, very, very hard that it would be also function for me. Yeah. But uh, there are this uh, unconscious dream of writing. Maybe this would be like the bodily writing. I don't know. Yeah. That's so interesting. Like, and I think this ties back into what Margarita was saying as well. In um, when Margarita, you were talking about Virginia Woolf and, and metaphor and stuff. And I think Malibu's got an interesting po uh, point here because, kind of in Malibu, it's not about using metaphors to speak about the body. It's about for Malibu, the body acts like a metaphor, the body interprets itself, the body uses metaphors in its own self-communication, I guess. Um, uh, so, oh, so uh, Ines has just said, could I say, yeah, I'll write that in the, the chat. In fact, there's, a, there's a, a few different books that she talks about that, so I'll write those in the chat. Um, yeah, Margarita, so you were saying to Jana, you could also look at Francisco Varela, Otto Poesis, and Bracha Ettinger's Co-Poesis. Um, Margarita, do you want to say a bit more about that? Uh, yes, uh, and I kind of stumble into that. I um, have a, an article that is coming out in uh, next issue of um, the Journal of Psychoanalysis and Culture, Culture and Society, um, about transplantation and like using uh, Braha Ettinger's idea of the matrixial. And I have to confess that although she takes this idea of copoiesis, which is the, the kind of the idea that as human beings, we co-emerge. Like uh, she's kind of trying to rewrite the maternal from psychoanalysis in a way that is different from the, the idea that we need to experience castration in order to become subjects, basically. And so she um, talks about a co-emergence of the child and the mother. And it's, it's very complex and hard to read. I'm not going to say it's in easy, that you're going to you know, uh, read it very easily. But um, I had not realized that she had based copoiesis on actually Francisco Varela's um, work with, and as Maria Diaz uh, remind, reminded us with the uh, neurologist uh, Umberto Maturana, was the, the two of them that work on copoiesis. I got to Francisco Varela because he has a, a short essay on his uh, experience with his liver, um, his liver uh, 
transplantation. <laughs> and um, but so I I I'm really interested, Jana, in, in your work because you have arrived to the same kind of uh, questions and 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 kind of longing for ways to express this dissolution of the self in your case because of, of the virus and issues at the molecular level when I was, um, that I have experience with transplantation at the kind of organic level, right? Um, where does the, where am I, am I, do I have a part, an actual part of another person within me? Is this person living within me? Um, or am I just totally parasitic? You know, it's like those um, kinds of, of questions that can arise. If, if, I'm, if I may, I just want to say quickly to, to Maria uh, how much I like her paper too. And um, it made me think of two different things. Um, one is, um, I, I guess you may have seen uh, Guillermo del Toro, The Shape of Water. Yeah. It's totally, I think Guillermo del Toro probably read that novel. I was not familiar with that novel, but I think it's really interesting. Of course, here is this being, it's not a machine, but there's so much about machines there too, right? Uh, and of course, so much about water and the, the feminine shape of water, right? And the other thing that came to mind was the Amela uh, Mano de Obra. Um, do you know Demela Altit? She's also a Chilean writer. Um, is a, no? It's, it's, no, please let me. In the United <laughs> States, she's, she's very well read. It's a, it's a favorite of, of um, people in American academia. So it's a complex writer too. Um, and, but she writes a lot later, most in the 90s, 2000s. So it's, it's the effects of the neoliberal politics of Chile. Mm -hmm. And um, one of her novels is called uh, Mano de Obra Mano and, de. Um, and about workers in, workers in a supermarket. But I think that, and it connects it with a famous uh, worker strike in mm -hmm. Chile where a lot of people died, I think. So you might want to look into her work also as a female writer who is engaging with, with um, you know, liberalism and capitalism. Definitely, thank you. Yes, actually, I'm a student of English speaking cultures. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not really in, um, studying Latin American uh, literature, but I am very interested uh, in that. So I might switch. I don't know. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> uh, Maria, did, did you have anything you wanted to uh, say about um, the shape of water in, in response to Margarita's? comment? Uh, yeah, well, when I saw that movie, actually, I thought about Lovecraft and uh, about uh, all of these uh, hybrids, um, this hybrid bodies um, between human and monster and how um, they become to be and what they what they do and everything. But yeah, definitely water is um, a big theme <laughs> that can be can be anything depending on how you see it as well um, consciousness or the the womb and and so on so it's a it's a work it's a good observation and i think i would like to think about it more as well brilliant thank you very much uh, do we have any other questions for anyone on on the panel Uh, yes, there was a hand just went up. Uh, where is it? Yeah, Ines. Hi, sorry, I keep my camera off because my internet is not so well. Can you hear me fine? Yeah, absolutely. Great. So I really like the combination of the three talks. I know Jana's work a bit, but not too well. And in the combination with the other two works uh, or the other two presentations, 
um, it made me really wonder about the role of pain um, as a sensuous experience. And because also um, with Maria's talk, which was, as far as I understood, not so much about physical pain, but more about mental, social, mainly, I guess, pain. And I really like that Margrethe talked so much about uh, anesthetics of pain and the sensuous experience of pain. And so, uh, Jana, I was wondering um, if, because you were talking about the virus as your teacher. And as far as I know, and from the parts you read, um, it is, what you learned about viruses is a is a lot of also biotechnical knowledge, I would call it. So um, is there, I mean, could you relate to this aesthetics of pain and maybe pain understood on several levels? I don't know if like physical pain played a role within your uh, being infected with the virus or within your treatment or the pain was on various levels? And if so, does this play a role or which role does it play for, for your writing? And yeah, I guess that's a question, right? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, of course, uh, pain uh, played a, a big role on several levels and uh, I would say the I have to say that the book is um, formed by different literary genres, and there are these uh, like interviews with the physicians, and uh, there is also like something like a diary, which is also something diary, but also hypomnemnata, and in this hypomnemnata, there somehow like in an abstract way. Uh, pain is a topic, of course, and uh, there is uh, like one very special uh, thing that uh, when I start, I start in this diary, I start the treatment and I kind of uh, wait that a war begins. And then and I start to realize that these metaphors, how we describe the interaction with pathogens and the body, but also a kind of uh, the interaction with the, with the cure and the virus, I, I saw it as a war and this war didn't happen. I, I, I kind of expected to feel pain and this didn't happen. The pain was somewhere else by kind of uh, realizing when we are describing these interactions with pathogens, that it makes something with us and it makes something with our thinking because I wasn't at a war with the virus or the virus wasn't at war with this, with this, uh, with this substance, with the cure. But uh, yeah, it was more in, on, in this uh, metaphorical level because it didn't happen. Was this uh, answer enough or? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, we've had a few comments in the in the chat as well. Um, Margarita that said yet I'm working on a book that also mixes genres. Um, and uh, then Lucy says, I'm really sorry if this has been mentioned. I missed the first two presentations. But has Christian Bock been mentioned? He encoded poetic cipher into the genetic code of E. coli bacteria in a project called Xenotext or something like that. Um, yeah, so I, I guess that question is for mainly for Jana, but I guess if, did, did anyone mention Christian Bach there? Sorry, uh, I just I just thought uh, that he might be interesting in terms of writing, um, uh, kind of engaging with the virus in the way that, although I miss your presentation from what I've understood, 
uh, from what you said since, I, I just wondered if, as he's approaching it from a different way, he's actually writing into genetic code mm. rather than writing as. as you know. well, I would love to read uh, your work. It sounds fascinating. That sounds absolutely amazing, Lucy. Could you? Could you? Um, I don't know Christian Bot. Could you? Um, say a little more who who that is and and what he and and what he's doing with the genetic code. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not an expert in him, but he's a, a Canadian um, poet. Mm. And quite a lot of experimental writing. So the genetic code project is uh, ongoing, I think. Um, and he's done lots of varied other work as well. So, um, and it's B-O with an umlaut, K. But, um, I mean, you can find him uh, online. That sounds amazing. I'm definitely going to look into that. Thanks very much. Um, Margarita, you've got your, your hand up. Is that for a previous question or did you? Uh, yes. I wanted to uh, also comment to uh, Ines and um, I think I also feel a little bit like what is similar to what Jana was saying, that a lot of the pain is mental pain. Like, it's very hard to when the physical pain is excruciating, you cannot do anything, right? And and then you can you can write about it, you can try to describe it, but but I think that the 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 pain of the diagnosis itself, I think that is something that, that came with, with Jana, the pain to know that there are uh, drugs that could heal you, but you cannot afford, cannot afford them. Like so, so there is a lot of mental health that is involved, and it's very hard to separate what is strictly physical pain. It will be unless you enjoy pain, you know. But, but I think it will be no. But yeah, me neither. But but I think it will be um, difficult to to for me to, and I think for most people to imagine physical pain that is separated totally from mental pain. Right? That we process it through our brains and um yeah, I, I and like, I just, sorry yeah. I, I would like to say something uh to this uh to this topic like when you know that there is a cure and you can't afford it and uh this was kind of very crazy because uh I knew it from from the day it was here, and uh, then like every month they changed the laws around it, and so I was like, my doctor was calling me, or I was calling my doctor, and uh, it was sort of really crazy. First, I I um, thought that I will do like uh, with the buyers club, I will buy it through India and and let it ship to through Australia because uh, the Swiss government uh, they changed the laws for this they changed like this parallel import laws because if of because of this hepatitis C cure so I was like okay I need to get this money and uh, because uh, in Switzerland the the health insurance is mandatory but they weren't they 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 didn't have to pay it and so it, this whole change is constantly it was crazy and i think this kind of pain it's uh yeah this this is described in the book when i'm talking to my physician yeah and also knowing that i'm actually in a very privileged position because at the end I received the cure but there are still million people who have no chance to receive it and this kind of pain also it's kind of uh, described in the book yeah thanks very much Jana we've got um, another question in the chat from Naomi who says Margarita in a session yesterday there was a mention of the idea of transplantation and the medically changed body in Nancy's Lantru, his personal writing after a transplant. And it made me think of your work, Corazon de Jorjalata, sorry again, where the concept of biotechnology or medical machinery is, of course, reflected in your use of the adjective 
Hohalata. Sorry, I just cannot say that word. Hohalata. I think of los dioses de la tecnología me otorgaron una segunda vida. I wanted to ask about the autobiographical experience of writing in illness and then in healing. Did you find language an adequate medium to account for the painful memory of illness? Was writing in illness a different experience to writing in wellness? Um, yes and no. I, I wrote um, a lot. I wrote as soon as I could hold a pencil after something, after each one of my medical interventions. Um, and, and I was curious about, um, oh, I forgot her name right now, but, um, the presentation yesterday about the, the, this Italian poet and the fact that the, that the poet herself, uh, went back to the poems and she wrote them while she was in the, um, uh, psychiatric um, uh, crisis, but then she, rewrote them, right? And I think the way, the way this was discussed was a little bit like that that, that um, was kind of disguising the experience or, or changing it. But I think it's totally legitimate. You know, as, as writers, we work with our writing and, and we do not and well we can discuss the, the idea of agency which was central for the for that paper but the the idea that that we want to to have control over what we write and for me writing while i was sick was precisely the fact that i wanted to have as much control as possible over my own story. You know, if I was going to disappear from work for two months, and it, it ended up being a lot longer, but um, I wanted people to, to know what was happening to me from what I said and not for there to be rumors of what was happening to me. Um, and so, and, and regarding the, the part of your technology, yes, that figures a lot in my in my work, in uh, particularly in the poetry. Uh, the the paper that I presented today was uh, an attempt that I, I I've been thinking of this for years now because people, if they read my blog, they will ask me, well, why did you write about this like this so publicly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And but if they um, 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 read my poetry, they would say. Why did you write poetry and not a different genre? <laughs> so it's like I, I've been thinking of the the genres we choose, and in my case, is has to do with with just the the mental and physical space where I am. So right now, I'm trying to organize my blog, combine it, and perhaps with new poetry, perhaps even with drawings. And so I was very inspired by by Jenna's description of the work. I'm going to look uh, for it. <laughs> Thank you. Ben, you're muted. Oh, thanks very much, Naomi. <laughs> so after all this time, like it's still so easy to do, isn't it? Um, so yeah, I think we've got one time for one last question. So if anyone has one final question, uh, let me know or put it in the chat. I guess um, if no one else has any other questions, I just had one final question for Maria. Um, just uh, what is your own personal reaction to your final question in your in your um, in your presentation about uh, whether this was a suicide, a liberation, or a or, or a, a kind of transformation? Where do you sit on that? Uh, that's. Um... That's a difficult question, actually, because the first time I read the, the, the short story, um, I felt very, um, I, I, I was quite judgmental. Yeah, so I said, no, you, that she was crazy. She was uh, 
um, no, she, she, that was suicide. Yeah. But then after reading it again and going into different passages of the text, then I realized that I, I think it's more like a liberation, I would say. Yeah, more than more than the cyborg, to be honest. Yeah. You're muted, so we cannot hear you. <laughs> <laughs> that, that seems like a very positive, uh, a positive outcome and a, a very positive um, note to end on, maybe. And um, the time is three o'clock, so um, I'm going to thank all of the the, um, the contributors for their fantastic papers. I've really, really enjoyed this panel. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you also to Naomi uh, for producing this uh, panel and overseeing the technical side of things. And uh, yeah, I'll see everyone hopefully in half an hour where we've got um, an amazing keynote from Susan Stryker. So I'm really looking forward to that. Thanks very much, everyone, again, and see you, see you shortly. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Panel 5A. Uh, happy Saturday. It's weekend. It's really good to see loads of people here, though. Um, so, uh, yeah, this panel is called Wording Chronic Illnesses, and we're going to have three speakers and then Q&A at the end. So Charlotte Hallahan is a faculty-funded PhD candidate in the School of Literature, Drama and Creative Writing at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, UK. Her thesis examines the relationship between modernist literary practices and British psychoanalytic and medical institutions during the Second World War. She's interested in the intersections between psychoanalytic and literary understandings of materiality and the body. And Charlotte's paper today is called Endometriosis and the Language of Pain in Hilary Mantle's Giving Up the Ghost. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a little bit of a, um, a segue from my um, doctoral work, um, but hopefully, hopefully, hopefully it's still interesting. Um, so I'll just do an audio description. I'm um, a white woman with um, kind of medium length um, brown hair with a fringe and a black shirt um, with flowers on it. Just going to share my screen. So in her memoir, Giving Up the Ghost, written in 2003, Hilary Mantel narrates her suffering of endometriosis, a disease of the womb that causes her intense, protracted pain. Mantel's memoir details her personal traumas caused not only by the disease, but by years of misdiagnosis and mistreatment. So throughout this paper, I argue that autobiography forms the basis of Mantel's textual recovery. The memoir is a space where she can reclaim her body from cold, clinical, and as she sees it, um, sometimes even tyrannical um, medical authorities. To gain new agency, I suggest, Mantel writes frankly about her mutable, leaking, and abject body. So during this presentation, I'll examine Mantel's language of illness and pain, her efforts to represent her suffering of endometriosis in her own voice. Um, for Mantel, the real experience of endometriosis cannot be located in the dusty pages of medical textbooks or rationalised by the careful speech of doctors. Rather, it is subjective, it's violent, it's bodily, and it belongs only to her. Um, this paper will suggest that her memoir operates as a pro project of bodily reclamation. So in her seminal work, the Body in Pain, Elaine Scarry discusses the isolating nature of pain, which, she argues, can only exist within the boundaries of one's own human body. Scarry suggests that this is because pain brings a destruction of language. Pain is unshareable as it brings about an absolute split between, between one's sense of reality and of other person's realities. For Scarry, pain exists outside of language, language reducing our expression of it to a primal pre-language of cries and groans. Quote, physical pain does not simply resist, but actively destroys, um, resist language, but actively destroys it, bringing about an immediate reversion to a state anterior to language, to the sounds a human makes before language is learned. So pain is thus the highest challenge of representation in literature. Indeed, Scarry notices that this is where the artist has often fallen silent. 
So in Giving Up the Ghost, Mantel depicts her struggle to communicate the pain she is experiencing. Her endometriosis causes, quote, a pain which I could not explain, that seemed to wander about my body, nibbling here, stabbing there, flitting every time I tried to put my finger on it. But Mantel does not ground these failings of representation in pain's destruction of language, as Gary does. For Mantel, it is the doctor who reduces the patient to a pre-language of cries and groans, whose use of medical jargon forecloses any possible expression of pain. So during her visits to her doctor, Mantel struggles to understand her illness due to the isolating nature of medical equipment. The lines on her x-ray appeared to her, her like skilled calligraphy, the actor's neat to diacritical marks in a language she would never learn to speak. So begins a power struggle between Mantel and her doctors. In order to gain some agency over her body, Mantel strives to learn the critical language used by medical professionals. She finds means of self-diagnosis in textbooks, where she studies diagrams until, quote, for each organ, there was a pain, and of each pain, I had a sample. As time wears on, Mantel becomes canny to her doctor's deliberate use of medical language to hide his uncertainty. I think endometriosis was, um, and this took place around 1970 when endometriosis was being very commonly um, misdiagnosed. So at one moment in the memoir, the narrator tells her husband that the doctor stumped on what her disease could be, had called it idiopathic something something. Mantel ridicules his careless choice of technical language. I had grinned when he said idiopathic. I knew what it meant, disease about which we doctors have no bloody idea. In her memoir, Mantel just aims to dismantle the language of pain from the um, intellectually superior doctor. By doing so, she challenges and perhaps attempts to close what Scarry calls the absolute split between one's own suffering and another's. So in order to reclaim her bodily narrative, Mantel uses her memoir to explore the visceral experience of endometriosis, the raw corporeal manifestation of the disease. Here Mantel relates her illness through portrayals of blood and pus. She exposes us to the abject. Um, I'm sure you know that the abject um, is a term theorized by Julia Kristeva in her book, Powers of Horror. And it refers to the human reaction of disgust or revulsion caused by something which breaks down the distinction between subject and object or self and other. So an example of this might be um, the sight of a corpse. The corpse causes horror because it reminds us of the materiality of the human being, of our status as object. And we also reject and are repulsed by things like excretion and refuse because they remind us that our bodies are subject to ambiguous limits. Kristeva writes that, quote, these bodily fluids, this defilement, this shit, are what life withstands hardly and with difficulty on the part of death. There I am at the border of my condition as a living being. Abjection, she writes, serves the human need to preserve themselves in severance. It is a reflexive move to protect the distinction between human and animal. But in giving up the ghost, Mantel attempts to blur this boundary between the subject and the object. If the object means we are driven to maintain a purified whole self and tarnished by mucus, sweat and blood, then Mantel works to fragment that self. In an essay written in the LRB, Mantel criticizes Virginia Woolf's essay on being ill. Virginia, she writes, never oozes, quote, her secretions are ladylike, tears not bile. She may, as well have not have, she may as well not have had bowels for all the evidence of them in her book, end of quote. In Giving Up the Ghost, however, Mantel consistently reduces her own body to flesh and does not bulk at, it, at its abject processes. Instead, there is some kind of meaning to be found within the meaty body. In one moment, Mantel describes um, being examined by a professor at out, at out patients. This is by no means a ladylike moment. Though she bleeds all over his hands, Mantel describes her wish that he would continue pushing, quote, into the unseen smoking meat of her body and finding out its truth. Though Christova describes objection as revulsion or sickness at the realization of materiality, for Mantel, confronting the object is an important and even beneficial stage in the battle for agency over her body. 
From the place of the embodied abject, I believe, Mantel can more effectively explore and overcome the boundaries of the ill body. She can find out its essential truth or even reclaim its language. But Mantel's is no ordinary memoir. Alongside her tales of power struggles of various doctors and her visceral descriptions of the suffering body, Mantel describes supernatural occurrences, ghosts that seem to haunt her house, unknown absences that appear at the end of her garden path. So though we are reading um, kind of a memoir, we open um, up giving up the ghost at the uncanny sighting um, of a spirit. Quote, about 11 o'clock, I see a flickering on the staircase. I know it is my stepfather's ghost coming down, end of quote. If the object is seeing too much, where too much is being revealed, then it is interesting that Mantel pairs her narrative of abject illness with representations of ghosts and spectres, things that lie beyond the borders of reality. Mantel's childhood and developing illness is revealed through encounters with these ghosts, which play a part in the very writing of her autobiography. Quote, I am writing in order to take charge of the story of my childhood and my childlessness, and in order to locate myself, if not within a body, then in a narrow space between one letter and the next, between the lines where the ghosts and meaning are. End of quote. For Mantel, ghosts haunt her work. They lie beneath and between every line. She writes that, Quote, the wraiths and phantoms creep under my carpets and between the warp and weft of fabric. In deconstructing and breaking apart her body, Mantel sees potential for discovery of new forms of knowledge. Her retelling of the abject illness is filled with these ghosts that are seen and known only by her. In one moment, Mantel tastes blood and sick as she sees a mysterious absence at the bottom of the garden, after which she writes she was never quite the same. So Scarry posits that pain must be considered as the unmaking of the world, as with it, quote, the content of one's world disintegrates, so the content of one's language disintegrates, as the self disintegrates. However, Mantel's pain does not deconstruct her world or destroy her voice. It gives her another, higher mode of access. By pairing her account of endometriosis with these mysterious ghostly sightings, Mantel connects her fleshy body to a new form of liminal knowledge. So Mantel's ghosts also signal an, account, an encounter with the sublime space between living and dead, between tangible or intangible. The spirit or ghost has no body. It appears opposite to the abject, which entails the exploration of that which is base and material. It instead lies on the boundary of the invisible, it is there one moment and gone the next. So when Mantel writes of ghosts, she can, in her words, cancel her existence and go beyond the real and visible to enter this transient, sublime space of the other. But although the ghosts are seemingly opposite to the object, they are similar in that they both signify this border between life and death. For Mantel, a ghost offers a glimpse of the ulterior knowledge that she might be able to access by teetering on this very border. So in the penultimate chapter of her memoir, Mantel describes how ghosts approach her in these dreams. Risen from the ground, they are naked and sexless, foul-mouthed and knowing. My impulse is to injure or kill them, swap them like flies. But then I wake up chilled and put up my hands to be sure that services are solid, that my own flesh is still warm. I grope for a pen and write down my dream. So here the, the sight of ghosts is paired with the act of writing, with intellectual work. So immediately after this, Mantel takes her dream to the keyboard, hoping to relay her experience and to mince the presence of ghosts into words. She attempts to find logic in the illogical to relate her hallucinations to her own experience of everyday life. We can also see that Mantel combines this encounter with depictions of the living body, with the still warm flesh that reminds her of a bodily presence, her status as object. It is also interesting that the ghosts that appear are naked and sexless, they are not afflicted with womb or phallus, they are not um, subjected to the same bodily illness that Mantel suffers from. They exist on that sublime border between self and other. So with the appearance of ghosts, Mantel opens a figural gap in the memoir 
a literary form that ordinarily is preoccupied with the telling of real historical events. Van Pell's ghosts are free from logic. Their appearance signals the past interrupting the present, complicating the notion of stable experiential time on which the memoir depends. So in his book on ghosts and literature, um, Luke Thurston argues that ghosts, quote, emerge as a special kind of event that is situated on the edge of the void. That is, as the rupture of consistent presentation of the plausible discursive order of things, thus as an uncanny effect of the inconsistency of being itself, end of quote. So similarly, Mantel's ghosts disrupt the memoir's temporal and historical order so that Mantel can ex access an unstable ahistorical time. They deconstruct the binaries of alive and dead and past and present, opening up a transient space for new knowledge to be learned. Indeed, Mantel's acknowledgement of objection, the body's existence on the very precipice of death, allows her to access this new mode of being altogether. So Mantel's life writing is not just about writing the self into being, but also about deconstructing the self. In her memoir, she reduces her body to, and this is um, quoting from Mantel here, nuts and bolts, my inside is outside, the body sewer pipes and bolts exposed to view. End of quote. With the abject, Mantel ensures the demystification of the perfect self, which, which does not bleed or seep, sweat or shit. As Kristeva has outlined, this sublime experience of the abject expands and overstrains Mantel's body, allowing Mantel's illness, which would usually be subordinated by the te technical language of doctors, a new transient space for expression. Mantel's illness paves the way toward ulterior knowledge in her discovery of things that are unseen, that lie on the edge of reality. This knowledge is signalled by the ghosts and spectres that consistently plague her. Ghosts has become the language for Mantel's memoir. They signal the ambiguous silent space that only she, in her real body, can access. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was brilliant and and so so theoretically rich. So many like amazing uh, philosophies of illness that um, that I th would be amazing to talk about more in the Q and A. And that I think um, dialogue really well with uh, Katia's paper as well. So looking forward to talking about that more. Um, I'll move on to our third and final speaker for the day, which is Claire um, Gentil. Is uh, Clara, am I pronouncing your, your surname right? Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, so, uh, Claire Gentil is a second year PhD student in Literature and Medical Humanities, CNRS of Bonne Nouvelle. Um, specialised in French and English literature, she researches the literary representations and perceptions of uh, epilepsy in contemporary literature from 1980 to the present. She's in charge of the PhD Students Network of the Medical Humanities, IRN of CNRS in France. Her work is supervised by Alain Schaffner, Sorbonne Nouvelle, and Catriona Seth, All Souls College, Oxford. In 2020 to 2021, she has a 10-month placement at the Maison Française d'Oxford. And um, Claire's paper title is Contemporary Women's Writing on Epilepsy, a case study on meta-narrativity. Thanks very much, Claire. Thank you for having me. I hope you can see my PowerPoint correctly. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to audio describe myself. I'm a white French woman with light brown curly hair and I wear a black t-shirt. Um, so there have, been, there have been many debates regarding narrative and its roles in the illness experience and what to do with it. Schematically speaking, for some it could be the center stage of care, uh, as Frank stated it in 1995, and for others it could be the worst danger, as Strawson stated it in 2004. Since then, medical humanities developed a more critical stance, reorienting its point of views on narrative, i.e. Woods. In this paper, I don't want to take part right away in such a debate, and rather I'm going to investigate one specific disease, epilepsy, and starting from this biomedical framework, I'm going to read three books, which all display meta-narrativity. And 
in order to understand what are the implications of such choice in an epilepsy narrative. Doing so, I show you that narrative is not questioned as being present or not in patients' lives, but rather under which form. Finally, I will put into perspective those conclusions by drawing on feminist critical theories to highlight the role of female writers in the deepening of epilepsy cultural representations. So epilepsy is a chronic and neurological illness which manifests through seizures, surprising the patient in their daily life rhythm. Epileptic seizures can lead to a loss of consciousness, but also of memory. Usually the patient goes through different phases, which might generate multiple narratives when trying to collect their memories afterwards. So there are different phases in the epileptic seizures, which are the pre-ictal, ictal, post-ictal, and inter-ictal phases. Moreover, there are different kinds of epilepsy and the type of seizure can change over time for one same patient. Those narratives are not meaningless. They enable caretakers to track down the evolution of the disease and to locate the areas of the brain which are suffering. That is why more and more epilepsy advocates and caretakers talk about the role of narrative in the therapeutic follow-up of epilepsy. I should also mention that the patient's narratives are not always reliable because their consciousness is at least blurred and sometimes they are totally unconscious and cannot remember anything from the seizure or even realize they just had one. So that's why I think we really, I think we really need to be aware of this diversity of narratives. Otherwise, we might not be able to hear the patient's lived experience. In my PhD research, I, took, I look at contemporary epilepsy narratives I've noticed that most of them use meta-narrativity, but what is specific here is that they seem to understand meta-narrativity in a wider sense, or I should say a more ethical way. Of course, their narratives tend to reflect a lot on their process of narration as such, which is what we usually consider as meta-narrativity. But the researcher Anna Meritoya argued not long ago for a deeper understanding of meta-narrativity. She understands it as I quote narratives that make narrative their theme and deal with the significance of narratives for human existence in general, for how we understand ourselves, others, the world, and history, end quote. I want to argue that it is this type of meta-narrativity that we find in epilepsy narratives because they underline the importance of narrative in the therapeutic follow-up, but more importantly, in the patient's daily life. It is as if people with epilepsy were disdained for a more ethically charged voice in published illness narratives, because it is an illness which impacts ontologically the sick person. Maybe it's another symptom of epilepsy, to not have the choice of the multiplicity of narratives, to have to reflect on them, on them so as to, be, to better follow the illness evolution. So in all the readings I've been doing for my research, I encountered three books in which this meta-narrativity was the most displayed and the most relevant regarding the topic of epilepsy. The first one I'm going to talk about is the acclaimed The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down by Anne Fediman. The writer takes on the anthropological journey when she starts following the Lee family and the story of the little Leah. Leah is a two years old girl who grows up in a Hmong family who is living in California. She is diagnosed with severe epilepsy. The book explores the clash between two cultures, that is to say two medical cultures. First of all, according to the Hmong one, epilepsy is a blessing, which shines a, line, a totally different light on this chronic illness than the one we are used to in Western cultures. According to the Californian doctors though, Leah's epilepsy needs to be treated. I quote, the monk have a phrase, which means to speak of all kinds of things. It is often used at the beginning of an oral narrative as a way of reminding the listeners that the world is full of things that may not seem to be connected, but actually are. That no event occurs in isolation, that you can miss a lot by sticking to the point, and that the storyteller is likely to be rather long-winded. Since I'm not a monk, I will go back only a few hundred generations to the time when the Hmong were living in the river plains of north central China, end quote. So right away, and you see this is on page 13, and we understand that for the Hmong people, meta-narrativity is a way of thinking, living, and socializing. 
So if you add that to the fact that epilepsy is understood by the monk as a proof of a divine voice who requires attention, then this whole investigation becomes a living and thus changing palimpsest of narratives. The inherent as visual aspect of the disease naturally generates interpretations and misinterpretations on all sides. This book shows how much epilepsy can foster meta-narrativity, that is to say, ethical reflections on an interpreted experience. The work of Fadiman is the work of a craftswoman. It is the work of someone who understands the specificities of epilepsy and how troubling it can be for the sick person themselves, but also for their family and their caretakers. So the spirit catches you suggests that treatment is a matter of interpretation. And the second book I'm going to study now underlines that diagnosis is also a matter of interpretation, if not of fiction. This book I'm talking about is The Contentious Lying, a metaphorical memoir by Lawrence Slaughter. You might also be familiar with this book as it fostered lots of reflections in disability studies and in medical humanities more broadly. The text takes us on a metaphorical journey through the memoir of Lawrence Slaughter, who tells the story of epilepsy, Munchausen syndrome, and personal fictions. She addresses the reader, provokes them, and gives counterintuitive clues. I quote, I have epilepsy, or I feel I have epilepsy, or I wish I had epilepsy so I could find a way of explaining the dirty, spastic, glittering place I had in my mother's heart. Epilepsy is a fascinating disease because some epileptics are lawyers, exaggerators, makers of myths, and high-flying stories. Doctors don't know why this is, something to do maybe with the way a scar on the brain, dense memory, or mutated reality. My epilepsy started with the smell of jasmine, and that smell moved into my mouth. And when I opened my mouth after that, all my words seemed colored. And I don't know where this is my mother, or where this is my illness, or whether, like her, I am just confusing fact with fiction, and there is no epilepsy, just a clenched metaphor, a way of telling you what I have to tell you, my tale, unquote. This quotation, which starts almost with an epanaphora amplified bit by bit, proves how deep she reflects on her personal story and how to transmit it. Of course, this is contentious because Flotter constantly links epilepsy to metanarrativity, and she goes as far as to suggest that persons with epilepsy are makers of myth stories and even strategize with them. It's one of the reasons why uh, several disability studies scholars said that this book was, st was stigmatizing persons with epilepsy. Whereas for others, she tackles the important topic of diagnosis and fiction. And it's also what we see by the end of this quotation with this rhetoric and beautiful spin on smell. So the book is also a reflection on the power of literature and the necessity of meta-narrativity which here enables the writer to explain her poetic project. And finally, I'm going to talk about The Unknown, Le Cas Singulier de Benjamaté by Catherine Roland. Catherine Roland is a French emergency physician. In her first novel, she tells the story of Benjamin, who is an epileptic ambulance driver. He decides to take part in a medical trial to try and heal his epilepsy. As a consequence, he experiences weird visions and dreams, which with each of his epileptic seizures, leading him into another time and another place. The split temporality clearly expresses the split experience of the seizure and the difficulty of gathering narratives when clinicians press the patient to get some information. The book displays meta-narrativity as described by Meritoya because the theme of the book is literally how two narratives are embedded into one another and how they affect the character's daily life and health. The fact that Benjamin has some sort of dreams or hallucinations is a sign for the doctor that the clinical trial doesn't work as it was supposed to. So she clearly asks him narratives as detailed as possible. I quote and translate, Benjamin, I am all right. I had a weird dream. A dream, repeated Aubervilliers, disconcerted. It's impossible. The brain disconnects during the seizure. The patient doesn't keep any memory of it. You know that. She was severe, like unhappy that I was bringing into question the fundamental basis of a science that she mastered better than me. Illnesses belong to doctors, never to patients, end quote. The doctor needs this description, but still she doesn't believe him and imposes on him the only true voice. 
the one of physicians and not patients. Because actually what she wants is a unified, stable narrative, something logical, simple, symptomatologically flawless. Benjamin is so aware of that, that during the novel, he tries many times to express his narrative in a way that would not upset his doctor. So now that we've understood how diverse and complex meta-narrativity was in those texts, I want to suggest a feminist reading of it. Since the 1970s, many literary theorists who came from feminism wrote about voices in literature. One of the first ones, the famous French writer Hélène Sixou accused monologic settings in literature of that time, underlining that most famous writers were men and that they created monological and thus patriarchal voices. According to Sixou, with this literature, we are deemed to hear only one voice, the pretending voice of truth, the one of men. For Sixou, however, women do have the power to overpass this hegemony because they naturally have access to what she calls the source of the locus for the other in the love of the Medusa. This is the so-called feminine écriture of Sixou, a type of writing that seemed to emerge from deep down, from the womb, a way of stepping up against monological voices by facing the other, differences and diversity. Of course, the problem of this interpretation is that it is essentialist. But I think that in the three texts I presented, authors displayed the same energy, which defies the traditional monologue. That is why I think the feminist reading helps to underline that meta-narrativity is a means to find the liminal way, the in-between, the complexity, which is not always granted to oppressed people. It's an occasion to show reality in a less simple and flawless way, to prove that transformation is always possible. Moreover, I think that queer theories might be a way of opening up illness narratives to diversity without essentializing it. They enable one to understand one's own and inner diversity, richness, the fact that oneself is made of a variety of voices, or at least not the only one voice imposed by patriarchy. It is not about pure difference. It's more about acceptance, to acknowledge the fact that medically approved narratives are not always the one the lived body identifies to. Anyway, I don't want here to put together a feminist or a queer critic of epilepsy narratives. It is not my role nor no my goal, but rather to underline that illness, that it's the same system of oppression that imposes strong and uniformed reading impact to illness narratives than to women's writings. And that those theories can help to read illness narratives in a deeper way. To conclude, we saw that meta-narrativity enables a topic to be better understood and that it is best suited for chronic illness like epilepsy, which very much depends on narrative and its evolutions. It can be an interest, interesting form of transgression against a patriarchal and a blazed society. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Claire. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, Again, su such a theoretical, ri theoretically rich paper, which I think will dialogue so well with uh, Charlotte's and, and Katia's papers. Um, so we've got uh, uh, about just over half an hour now for, for questions. So, um, yeah, I think I'll open straight up to the floor. And if anyone has any questions, either put your hand up and you can ask it directly or write it in the chat and I could read it out, um, whatever you prefer. Yeah, Lindsay. Hi, sorry, it's uh, 4.30 a.m. in America, so a <laughs> wow. little, little rough. Yeah, uh, first of all, like these papers were all amazing. Thank you so much. That's why I'm getting up at 3.30 in the morning. Um, I'm curious because you guys were all talking specifically about um, physical illnesses, even though they can be invisible in the body. And we're kind of developing a language for writing about chronic illness as it's, you know, not linear as you all explored. I'm about to start uh, my PhD looking at chronic mental illness because we don't really have a framework for that. And I was wondering um, if you had any thoughts about, because it's so hard for these chronic illnesses specifically in women to be taken seriously, when you take that into the brain, do you think there could be an issue with people writing about chronic mental illness and using that to delegitimize people writing about chronic physical illness? Because in a lot of memoirs about um, 
chronic physical illness, especially for women, they're diagnosed as, you know, hysteria or depression, or, you know, like in the lady's mysterious handbook for uh, the lady's handbook for her mysterious illness by Sarah Ramey. I don't know if you guys have read it, but it's brilliant about, um, looking at autoimmune diseases. She says that, you know, she was offered Prozac over and over and over when she actually had, you know, real medical issues. Um, so as someone who doesn't have chronic, uh, physical illness, but has struggled with chronic mental illness, like depression, anxiety, and anorexia, I was wondering how you thought about how those could dialogue and, um, potential damage it could do. Cause selfishly, I just don't want to do any damage to the work that's already being done. Does that make sense? <laughs> and I guess I could, I could speak first to that. Um, yeah, I'm, I was struck when I was learning about um, endometriosis, how quickly depression was kind of diagnosed, especially in like the 70s. Um, and I think Mantel talks about being on antidepressants, as the first form of treatment. And she got a lot worse <laughs> as a result. And, um, but I don't think it does any damage to talk about like the complexity of chronic illness in women's experience. I think if anything, this kind of like shoehorning of physical illness into, or, or like trying to solve it as, as like hysteria or mental illness um, kind of does damage as well to people who suffer from chronic mental illnesses. All right, it becomes an easy fix, you know, something um, associated with their gender and associated with um, their being as 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 women um yeah i think it would be it sounds like a fascinating project and i Thank think you. it would be a really i think it would be a really good way of just like trying to carve out um yeah the complexity of chronic illnesses and yeah we have all spoke about physicality um but it might be a good way of like turning it back around and saying you know it's not always this is something also that women have dealt with and you know have um real problems with that haven't really been understood they've always just been an easy an easy cop out or an easy way out but yeah i don't think it will do any um in my opinion any real damage at all it's always good to capture that kind of complexity thanks um yeah uh Lindsay, thank you so much for your question and also for uh, waking up too early and for sharing um, <laughs> your project with us. Um, I think it's always um, very frightening when you start a new project, a new research project, um, to step up in a land which is almost unexplored. And so it's, I guess it's totally normal. And I definitely experienced the same feeling when I started my <laughs> PhD thesis. Um, but what I wanted to say is uh, for my subject, you know, epilepsy used to be um, studied by psychiatrists and also afterwards by neurologists. So it's always an in between in my topic. So it's something which is very difficult to deal with, and I'm not going to hide that. Um, <laughs> but the thing you have to bear in mind is that your texts are going definitely to help you and to lead the way for you. Uh, they are going to help you to find new ways, new frameworks, new theoretical frameworks. I think sometimes when I get lost because I don't have lots of th sources, like theoretical sources on epilepsy and narratives, I just look again at my sources and I reflect on them and I focus on the text. And then usually something came up. So this is like the methodological aspect of, of, of it. Like, <laughs> I think you, you're going to be fine and we definitely need someone who's going to try to propose a new theoretical framework for this particular topic. So good luck for your project. Thanks. That's, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. I am actually leaving for England on Tuesday. So I'm looking forward to being able to start it. And I might reach out to all of you if that's okay. But thank you for your really kind and thoughtful answers. Sure. <laughs> Thanks very much, Lindsay. And th and yeah, again, thanks so much for getting up so early. I love that energy of uh, of people kind of attending this conference at all times of day and night. Um, so we've got a question from Sabine in the uh, Sabina in the in the chat. Sabina, do you want to um, ask that question yourself, or I can read it out? Um, I'm I'm happy to um, to read it out. Yeah. 
Um, so I, I, uh, I have a question for Charlotte. Um, so I've, I've noticed an uptick in media attention about endometriosis um, in the media. There's been like a, a flurry of, of uh, articles. I think I've seen a few in The Guardian. And um, I was thinking here in particular of like, there's like a photo essay in The Guardian that had sort of um, somebody who has endometriosis had taken photos of their sort of endometriosis journey. But I really... Um, it seems like there's uh, like a, a lot of the attention is on um, particularly sort of white cisgender women who are like, um, you know, incredibly skinny and um, which, you know, d just doesn't even really fit in with like common things like endo belly where you, um, you know, get like so bloated that you end up looking pregnant. Um, so, yeah, I just feel like a lot of the imagery that I see around like the endometriosis sufferer it's not reflective of like the actual people who are experiencing endometriosis and the kinds of um like bodily symptoms that that they experience so I was just curious to know because I've not I've not read Mantel's um memoir but I am like putting it on my reading list today <laughs> but I just wondered in what ways um Mantel is kind of disrupting some of those um uh, like fantasies of who it is who has endometriosis? Thank you, that's such a great question. Um, yeah, I I find Mandel's um, memoir so like so rich in terms of like kind of problematizing uh, a straightforward um, experience of endometriosis. Um, I think also this, this came out about 20 years ago. So I, I think it was um, something which um, you know, she wrote when knowledge about this illness was, well, I mean, it wasn't as rich as it is now, but it's interesting that we don't, we don't really remember like these forms of storytelling above probably more attractive forms um, in The Guardian or on um, like the opinion column of like very, um, yeah, cisgender white women um, who's like suffering is cleaner in some way. Um, but yeah, Mantel actually does talk a lot about um, her experience of endometriosis as being tied to her fatness and her like and her like experience of of feeling like she is um, like it be it becomes who she is in a really like kind of visceral way. Um, and I think that she really she draws that. That, that fatness as an important part of her experience with this disease, like this disease becomes the way that she is perceived in society. It becomes tied to her, like her lessening as a woman. It takes away her ability to, to have children. Um, in some ways, it, she feels like it, yeah, it takes away how she is perceived as being, you know, kind of an ideal woman and it becomes, um, quite problematic. I mean, she eventually begins to embrace that as something which is part of her identity and part of her experience, but she writes about how doctors see her as kind of like, you know, they, that is what they focus on, like your reproductive capabilities, your ability to do this. Don't worry, you'll still be able to do all these things that women should be able to do. But also, I do see like things kind of like, ghostly sightings and these like um, supernatural um, experiences that she writes about as problematizing a little bit about how what the endometriosis, endometriosis sufferer um, looks like, like the pairing this kind of um, description of the, the body of these like kind of very physical material experiences um, of bodily illness, which are quite like explicit and violent in some ways, um, with these kind of like hallucinatory experiences of like kind of ghosts, which are sexless and mouthless, and they are kind of outside of bodily existence. I think suggests something about what she is able to access through thinking more explicitly about her body and its existence. Um, yeah as an object and um i think it means i think it can pull those kind of gender categories um or it allows us to see how she pulls those gender categories 
um, yeah, just into, she is able to problematize them in like a new way. And I think it is her trying to consider what it means to be, you know, what it means to be a woman, what it means to have that gender on you and what it means when you can't fulfill um, some of those uh, prerequisites. But yeah, thank you. Great question. Thanks very much. Um, uh, Veronica, you've got your hand up. Do you want to go next? Yeah, I went clapping and I was like, no, <laughs> I just wanted to raise my hand. Yeah, clapping anyway. Uh, sorry for my Saturday look, guys. I haven't dressed up for the occasion. Um, thank you so much, Charlotte, for bringing the topic of endometriosis. As a stage four person with endometriosis, it's always great to see representation out there. So that's the first thing. The second thing is curiosity about the opening image you presented us with, uh, like, a, like an image of a, of a sort of um, NHS consultation kind of setting. So I was really wondering uh, about your choice of picture. But maybe you have something to say about that. And also, I wanted to sort of comment or put out there the idea of, uh, or problematize the idea of endometriosis as a disease of the womb. Because actually, um, endometriosis, uh, it's, um, it's actually cells and a stroma that resemble uh, the endometrium, which is the, the walls of the womb, but they, are, they don't still really know yet. They, they call it resembling or similar to. And, and it makes me think so much about Plato and Aristotle and the Wandering Room and all of that, you know, and all that sort of uh, background that we have. So, so I, I, I was wondering whether pro problematizing uh, the majority of the disease of the womb was interesting for us. And also we know that in the majority may appear in men. We know that it may appear in post hysterectomy women or people. So. Yeah, just uh, just to throw all of those ideas out there. Uh, I'm not sure yet, but I, I just wanted to share my doubts with everyone. Great, thank you, Veronica. That's great. Yeah, I chose that image because a lot of the um, uh, Mantos memoir is kind of interested in the ordinary kind of banal experience of healthcare. Um, a lot of what a lot of the um, memoir takes place in these kind of very like boring spaces like you know the clinical cold spaces I was a bit worried that 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 image would be quite um triggering for some of us to just look at like a one of those um NHS um rooms which you know could be associated yeah for me anyway it's um it's it's not a nice space and I think Mantel's memoir just kind of draws out how how like kind of heartless some of these spaces can be, especially especially in the 1970s, as a woman suffering from something which you know nothing, nobody really knew anything about. Or, you know, we still don't really know much about this thing, um, this disease, or this condition. Um, but yeah, absolutely, um, the idea that yeah, endometriosis is this is this nebulous thing which we have just tried to categorise as a disease of the womb, um, but it, it kind of exceeds those definitions in lots of different ways. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't really say how Mantel is able to kind of pull that into question because for her, she has to self-diagnose herself. She doesn't get a diagnosis at all. She eventually, I think eight years after she begins suffering from it, um, finds it written in a medical textbook and it's like, this sounds something like I'm, what I'm suffering with. Um, but the way she writes about pain isn't focused on her womb or on, um, on a very specific experience of endometriosis. It's something which um, actually it becomes quite a psychological, like psychosomatic thing for her. Like she begins to feel like flare ups of, of pain in her body when, um, when her, for example, when her brother, um, suffers from um, a bereavement she says that she has a flare-up you know in her in her head and in her heart and like it's like something like the way that she describes pain is not straightforwardly like um, textbook like or medical there is something quite interesting about um, 
how she depicts that disease. Um, but yeah, I also, I uh, I guess a bit like um, Katya's paper where she talks about how long COVID isn't quite understood or it's not quite, you know, it's it, it, we're still learning and, and um, finding things out about it as we, as we develop. Yeah, I think that, yeah, trying to understand Mantel's memoir is a good place to try and start understanding endometriosis as this like kind of fallible thing, this thing that can't be fixed or can't be, isn't, it doesn't have one space or time or place. It's something which is ever changing and it changes throughout her life. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't, um, I would love to just kind of, I'm going to, obviously I'll read a lot more about endometriosis, but I didn't quite realise that it was um, diagnosed um, or able to be diagnosed in men, for example. Um, so yeah, I will look, I'll look into that. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Yeah, I've, I've just Googled en endometriosis in men as well. Uh, it's just looking into it a little bit. Um, does anyone, uh, are there any more questions? I'll just wait a moment or two to see if anyone's got any. Can't see anyone raising their hand. Oh, okay. Um, so Lucia, um, Lucia says, just wanted to highlight something that Charlotte just mentioned, self-diagnosis and self-advocacy uh, seems to be such a big part of the endometriosis experience. At least it was for me. And it resonates a lot with what Katia was saying about long COVID, wondering if there is something more you would like to say about it. Thanks very much, Lucia. Sorry, I, I read out your uh, comment, but I, I don't know whether you want to um, come on camera or mic and, and ask, it, ask anything yourself. Okay, great. Uh, there's a, another comment from Veronica. Um, there is thoracic. Do you pronounce that thoracic or thoracic? Um, it's not. A, it's not a question. It's just to go delving in that idea of the outside and the excess. So it can appear anywhere in the body. And because because Katia was mentioning the lungs a lot, there is a lot. There is a lot of people whose lungs collapse because of endo. So it, it is to. My intention is to move away from this obsession with the pelvis and the womb, but acknowledge that it can place anywhere, it can appear anywhere in the body. Mm. And a funny one is eyelid endometriosis. Sometimes it appears there. So it's just like we do it. We just just Google like journals, eyelid endometriosis. It's just like yeah, uh, just to sort of undo that perception of being so focused on on always that area, but expand our understanding perception and awareness of the illness as something that can be anywhere in the body. Thank you. We also have Lucia who says those examples are fascinating, Katia. Thank you so much. I think there is a lot to be learned from these patient-led initiatives for disease research. Great question. Great. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Okay, so Sabina says, um, it seems in all three cases that there is an issue of the medical establishment systemic disbelief of women and other marginalized groups. Do the works you've studied suggest that it's enough just to ask doctors to believe women or is a more revolutionary overhaul necessary? Yeah, I would um, say that for Mantel, um, this process of her trying to relate her endometriosis to doctors is kind of part of a longer narrative about her kind of struggling against um, kind of systemic um, oppression throughout her whole life. Um, and she kind of frames, um, frames the kind of confrontation she has with doctors um, with her, her own like kind of Marxist beliefs in her early life about um, how to overcome kind of the boundaries of set on um she kind of imagines what would happen if um there's a funny moment in the book where, where she imagines how Marx and Engels might react to being in the doctor's office and being misdiagnosed and she's like I wonder if they would um say no you're wrong <laughs> or whether they would actually um go along with um uh 
what the doctor was saying, which is quite funny. Um, so, um, yeah, for her, there is definitely connections between um, what's, being, what's happening to her in medical settings and what's happening to her um, generally and socially and structurally. Um, a lot of the reason why she feels like she has to capture her body and her own voice is because she cannot, she cannot find the language for, um, yeah, for what she is suffering with anywhere in the world. And she is, her pain, even as a child, she connects to, um, so she kind of roots her endometriosis right back to her childhood and to like random bouts of pain she felt even as a very young girl. Um, yeah, and it becomes this like kind of larger project about um, the disbelief she she experienced by teachers and by various authorities. And um, yeah, so I think for Mantel maybe would say that this is a systemic um, problem about the way that we perceive bodies, um, women's bodies, um, what a normal body looks like, what it's like to go through a normal childhood and normal adulthood. Um, and that doing so without intense pain is seen as being kind of normal and functional in society. And um, what happens when you're not functional anymore? Um, you know, um, is it, should it always be a kind of disruption um, of your place um, in that society? But yeah, that's all. Um, and regarding epilepsy, um, in my corpus, but also more generally, uh, persons with epilepsy um, really just hope sometime for a demedicalization of um, the therapeutic follow-up of epilepsy. Um, because after a seizure, usually uh, people try to uh, contact uh, some emergency and lots of epileptic persons end up um, at the hospital, which is sometimes a very triggering place because healthcare setting is really stressful for epileptic persons who are triggered by stress. And for example, lots of questions for uh, a medic who doesn't believe you is really stressful and can trigger another seizure and another one and another one. So it's more of a broader issue than just the question of women epileptic person are not believed. It's much more of a like to broader question of how do we conceive our healthcare setting and where is how do we listen? How do we care? How do we welcome people in healthcare settings? So that's just on epileptic uh, persons. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, so uh, I'm just reading the chat. Um, Veronica said, uh, suggested Miranda um, Fricker's concept of epistemic injustice. Um, and Stephanie Barnes says, I'm finding the notions of disbelief, spectrality and women's corporality really interesting. Um, I think there's time for one last question. If, any, if anyone has one last, uh, one last question or comment. I just thank you for a brilliant conference. Not long to go. We can do this. <laughs> going, going. I um I, I had other questions about um uh I wanted to talk about uh Crip Time and Elaine Scarry and and all, all of these different kind of like philosophical uh figures that all three of you brought brought up. But I, I think uh like that's a, a longer conversation, so maybe not to have in the the final one minute. But hopefully we can uh, like have those conversations at uh, uh, another point. Uh, brilliant. Okay, so uh, I think that all that remind remains for me to do is uh, to thank you all again very much for an incredible panel, an incredibly theoretically rich, 
panel and a brilliant discussion afterwards. Um, thank you to everyone uh, for attending on a Saturday morning and people that are attending at 3 a.m. on a Saturday morning. It's like really infectiously great energy and I'm really enjoying it. And yeah, so thank you very much, everyone. And I'll see you at the next panels, which begin at 11.15 UK time. Um, and then we have uh, our next keynote at 1 p.m. with Elliot Evans, which is going to be brilliant. So, yeah, see you all in a bit. Thank you. Um, so, hello, everyone. I'm Adriana Paramo, and I will be the chair today. I'm really excited to be uh, part of this session because I think there are great uh, presentations coming up. Um, so, I'm going to introduce. Um, the speakers uh, they will present and then at the end we'll have a discussion um so oh i'm sorry i'm gonna start by um describing myself so i'm a spanish uh woman on her late 30s i have very curly hair and i'm wearing a pink shirt and a gray cardigan and i'm gonna now um introduce Catherine Bryan. Uh, she's going to be presenting the paper, Where Was My Party When I Had an Abortion? Caitlin Moran and Sarah Pasco Finding the Funny in Abortion. And I'm going to uh, read a little bit uh, of her bio. And I have to apologize because there are some French words. So I hope I'm going to read them correctly. Um, Catherine Bryan is in her third year of a part-time PhD in French at Lucy Cavendish College, the University of Cambridge. Her thesis examines literary depictions of abortion from Belle Epoque, France, providing feminist close literary readings of largely forgotten texts, such as Jane Carouchet, Lansemense, Maurice Landet, La Grappe, Jean Daricarre, Les Droits à l'avortement, and Camille Père Lothaire. She presented the paper Invisible Shame, the Female Experience of Abortion Across a Century from Jean Carouchet Lensemense to Annie Ernaud Le Venement at the Contemporary Women's Writing and the Medical Humanities Seminar in February 2021. Uh, so, Catherine, whenever you're ready. Thanks very much, Adriana. And thanks very much to Ben, uh, who's here, and Becky, who's elsewhere right now for this incredible conference um, and the seminar series as well. I'll just share my screen. Okay, uh, have we got the slide up now? We see that? Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, so I'll just um, audio describe myself first. Um, I am a white British woman um, with brown glasses, blonde hair, um, big silver hoop earrings, wearing a red dress with daisies on. Um, and before I start the paper today, I just want to give a quick Trigger warning, um, given that the panels are all on abortion anyway, I imagine that we've probably all come here aware that there's gonna be some sensitive material, but I just want to say that this paper does contain um, some fairly vivid descriptions of actually the abortion procedure itself. So I completely understand if anyone feels at any point they need to leave or, or mute me or whatever, I completely understand. Um, okay, um, right, so, uh, where was my party when I had an abortion? Kat Moran and Sarah Pascoe finding the funny in abortion. Um, on the 5th of March, 2017, comedian Sarah Pascoe appeared as a guest on Sunday Brunch. In response to a question on including material based on her personal relationships in her stand-up shows, she replied, it's odd because you think you're being complimentary to someone, but actually you're describing someone from the outside. People can be very sensitive about how they're put across because you might think you're saying a really funny thing, but actually they might think you're trying to make them look stupid or they don't want everyone to know about their abortion. So you have to double check. The reaction in the studio was one of shock with Pasco commenting in a later interview, they acted like I'd said I kill babies, like I knife them in the head, like I'll give anyone an abortion who's watching. I mean, honestly, they acted like I'd said something so crude. Part of having it as a human right is that it's also possible to talk about it without shame even on breakfast TV sometimes. The incident, for lack of a better word, was even deemed newsworthy by The Express and The Huffington Post, where stories with the following headlines appeared the next day. So we've got here The Express, Sunday brunch, guest leaves Tim Lovejoy speechless as she makes awkward abortion joke, and Huffington Post, 
Sunday brunch brought to a brief halt by abortion joke from Sarah Pascoe. This is not the only time that Pascoe has spoken publicly about abortion. In her first book, uh, which I've got the cover of on the screen here, Animal, the Autobiography of a Female Body from 2016, she discusses her own experience of having an abortion on her 17th birthday. Five years prior to this publication, Catelyn Moran, I've got the, her cover here, included an account of her abortion as a married mother of two in her first non-fiction book, How to Be a Woman, from 2011. So reviews featured on both of the covers make reference to their comedy. So we've got the back cover of Pascoe's book here. So for example, Pascoe's is a hilarious look at what makes us human, the funniest best book about sexuality ever written. Um, and then on Moran's, we've got, this is the funniest book of the year, uh, the funniest intelligent book ever written and engaging, brave and consistently cleverly naughtily funny. So what I will examine in this paper is how or even if both of these writers are able to find the funny in their experiences of abortion in a society where the majority still flinch at the mention of the word a la Tim Lovejoy and his guests. When conducting my research for this paper, I found that existing analyses of depictions of abortion in popular culture tend to fall within one of two camps that for the sake of simplicity today, I will call political and academic. By political, I mean an article that uses an analysis of a cultural work, be it literature, film or television, in order to push a political agenda, either pro-choice or pro-life. So one example of this would be the work of Dr. Jeff J. Colos, who has written over 40 articles on the subject of abortion in popular culture for the website lifeissues.net, which I've given a screenshot from the website there including one from July 2020, which was entitled Making Abortion, Infanticide and Euthanasia Funny, determining whether five principles of comedy derived from ancient writers apply to attempts at humour by contemporary comedians. There is a clear political agenda running through Colosa's article, with the inclusion of the word attempts in the title already giving a fair clue of what his ultimate conclusion will be, that such efforts have failed, uh, and that modern comedians need to abandon their illogical anti-life positions and support the lives of their fellow human beings. So there's a clear pro-life anti-abortion stance here. It is not my intention with this paper to put forward any political agenda, in particular with a topic which I know can be extremely sensitive. Instead, I hope to add to the academic writing on the topic, following the likes of Gretchen Sisson, whose excellent article, From Humour to Horror, Genre and Narrative Purpose, in abortion stories on American television, which provides a brief account of depictions of abortion on American television from 1962 to 2016 across five different genres. She writes, the presum presumption is that on-screen abortion stories have always been, and perhaps should be, unfunny. Abortion is a topic of such a controversy that it must be portrayed in a fraught and dramatic way. And I've just got here a screenshot from an episode of Bojack Horseman, um, which talks about abortion, which is the episode that she talks about in her analysis of abortion and comedy. She gives a really excellent analysis. I highly recommend the article. Um, but comedy uh, does not shy away from other controversial topics. So in her article on women and representation in British comedy, Lorraine Porter defines comedy as essentially an anarchic form that consistently resists notions of political correctness and polite behaviour. It is a cipher for antisocial desires that cannot be expressed elsewhere and as such often exalts in the breaking of taboos and canonical attitudes regarding the body, sexuality and social behaviour. Other bodily taboos such as sex, masturbation, scatology have found their way into mainstream comedy, but abortion is yet to find a comfortable place amongst them. In a feature article on the BBC from August 2019, Alice Jones examined the emerging trend of abortion as a topic in film and television and the work of female stand-ups from the UK and the US, including three shows from that year's Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Two of the comedians uh, have faced backlash to their handling of abortion with Tiff Stevenson, I've got an image of on the screen, uh, Tiff Stevenson was the target of a boycott campaign by Precious Life, an anti-abortion organisation in Northern Ireland, and Jenna Friedman, also pictured here. Uh, she discusses the reaction from far-right groups in her home country of the United States, which she fears may actually prevent her from being able to continue doing the same material in the future. Against this backdrop of abortion in contemporary popular culture, we have two writers, Moran, a journalist, and Pasco, a stand-up comedian, who, within five years of each other, publish accounts of their own abortions in comic autobiographies. 
The man's title, How to Be a Woman, suggests that it is a guide, but it's not quite that simple. She explains her intentions in the prologue, that there is no manual for becoming a woman, even though the stakes are so high. Um, uh, but that how to be a woman is the story of all the times that I got being a woman wrong with a bit of analysis-y, argument-y, this needs to change stuff, you know, feminism. Moran introduces her own take on what she sees as the future fifth wave of feminism. I would hope that the main thing that distinguishes it from all that came before is that women counter the awkwardness, disconnect and bullshit of being a modern woman, not by shouting at it, internalizing it or squabbling about it, but by simply pointing at it and going, ha, instead by inviting the reader to laugh at her and every instance that I had little or in many cases no idea of how to be a woman. She is also asking them to laugh at the patriarchy. In the 21st century, we don't need to march against size zero models, risible pornography, lap dancing clubs and Botox. We don't need to riot or go on hunger strike. There's no need to throw ourselves under a horse or even a donkey. We just need to look it in the eye squarely for a minute, then start laughing at it. We look hot when we laugh. People fancy us when they observe us giving our relaxed, earthy chuckles. Uh, now we turn to Pasco, who was also looking for answers with her book, but she turned instead towards evolutionary biology. I thought that if I could learn to understand hormones and desire and brain functions, then maybe I could make better life decisions. Maybe I wouldn't be so confused by myself. She outlines her intentions for the book. To highlight some of the aspects of womanhood I am struggling with, to discuss what science can teach us and how culture can hurt us. I want to show you that for every woman in the world, knowledge and communication are the finest form of self-defense, that empowerment lies in comprehending ourselves as beasts and in accepting ourselves as we were built. She focuses on the animal side of human nature and the subtitle, The Autobiography of a Female Body, reflects how Pasca gives accounts of her own lived experiences alongside explanations of the science behind how the female body works. Doesn't exactly sound like an obvious route for a stand-up comedian, but her day job allows Pasco to approach and explain the theory with humor in the way she contrasts the sort of serious bits with a disarmingly funny one-liner. Take the opening section, opening of the section on abortion, for example. Men make millions of sperm and can ejaculate them inside a woman via sexual intercourse. Sperm travel pretty slowly, it takes them about 10 minutes to cross the distance of a full stop. Luckily, there is not much punctuation inside of a woman. Instead, there is mucus, which is impenetrable if she is not ovulated, but much clearer, stringier, and perfect for sperm to travel through if she has. Mucus is so necessary, vital for conception. It's unbelievable that it is not more respected and popular. Sperm can't travel, can't reach over without it. We all have mucus to thank for our brilliant lives. Yet when you hand out flyers for your mucus appreciation society, no one wants to join. Hashtag ungrateful. So here Pasco moves between the scientific and comedic stars with ease. But as the chapter moves closer towards the procedure itself, these comic moments become less frequent. The first appears as an interjection from modern day Pasco in a moment of meta-narrative. And I realized while writing that sentence that I never paid my mum back. I just emailed her. I still owe you for my abortion. And she's written back, oh dear, kiss. I've replied, can you write something funnier so I can put it in my book? and she has texted me back her bank details with an aubergine emoticon. This sudden intervention from writer Pasco interrupts the flow of the narrative account of her abortion and provides a moment of light relief before the oncoming procedure. There is humour in the bathos of Pasco's mother's reply of, oh dear, but also a recognition from Pasco herself of the difficulty in writing about abortion in a funny way, hence her request for something funnier for the book. In her account of the day of the procedure itself, Pasco describes the protesters in front of the clinic, which she follows with a thought exercise, asking the reader to imagine how they would feel if a belief they were completely undeviatingly sure of, like paedophilia is wrong, were suddenly challenged by a change in the law. At this point, comedian Pasco interjects with a one-liner between these long paragraphs. Happy 17th birthday, Sarah! A line that only works when the reader recognises how unhappy and birthday-like and decidedly unpleasant the situation and serious discussion of these approaches to strongly held moral beliefs are. Then another lesson on biology and the initial stages of cell replication in the first weeks of pregnancy for another ethical discussion on the rights of the unborn with Pascoe's belief in a hierarchy and that the women's rights take precedence over the rights of the unborn. 
At the clinic, Pasco makes a joke based on her preconceived notions of what the counselling session would entail. I was really looking forward to it because I had seen counselling on TV and it looked great. You get to tell them how fucked up your parents made you and cry on free tissues, but this session was rubbish. After the one question counselling session, Pasco recounts her experience of the liminal space before the procedure. And now I waited with my naked bum on a chair in a cold corridor queuing for an abortion. The detail of the naked bum is a reference to what she goes on to describe as a traumatic aspect of the experience. I hadn't visualised this bit. I didn't know they would make me take my knickers off, put me in an operation gown, tell me where to wait and not look me in the eye. This bit was too hard and I would have liked to say, stop. Very politely and firmly, stop all this. Can I get dressed and go home now, please? This is a mistake. I don't want to have an abortion. But also, I don't want to be pregnant, so can we all agree that I've made a terrible mistake, whiz me back to the past and undo this? This moment is an extremely emotive description, so a depiction of the blind panic of a 17-year-old faced with the reality of the abortion clinic. The act of being forced to remove her underwear reveals her vulnerability and powerlessness in this moment, but also brings to mind the sex act which resulted in the pregnancy. Rather than have the reader question female agency in sexual encounters here, Pasco instead focuses on the image of the naked bum, she later refers to it as the cold bum, deliberately choosing one of the least clinical and most childish words for that part of the human anatomy in order to undercut the trauma here with humour. This leads to another aside from modern day Pasco, who imagines the best way to guide her nieces, not to scare them, but so they could visualise the, the connection. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying this Peppa Pig episode. Did you know that 20 seconds of awkward condom conversation can save you an hour of corridor purgatory waiting to have your womb vacuumed? Are you gonna call after the year awards or shall I? Here, Pasco makes light not of the abortion itself, but of the taboo surrounding conversations around abortion. As Pasco is then given a general anesthetic, there is no description of the procedure itself in the book. And the remaining pages of the section are dedicated to the lengths that women go to in countries where it's illegal, for example, there is a patient there from Ireland um, the, and the breakdown of her relationship with her boyfriend after the abortion. In her reflections on uh, the male experience of a partner's abortion, she notes uh, that she never discussed it with any of her previous boyfriends before providing the comic aside, I must write and ask on their Facebook walls immediately. Once again, making the joke about the inappropriateness of such an action due to the taboo. Throughout her discussion, Pasco only makes one joke which comes close to touching on the act of abortion itself at the beginning of the day before she encounters the protesters. It is her birthday present from Colin, her boyfriend. He bought me sweets for my birthday, jelly babies, and we laughed at the inappropriateness, but I still ate them. When the car stopped, I got out and sickened several colours onto the curb. Unlike the other interjections from modern day Pasco, here the joke is within the narrative of the day itself, and not only is the inappropriateness acknowledged, the rainbow coloured vomit acts almost as a rejection of this style of humour as well. Pasco's motto may be no shame and more prevention, but there is still a palpable reluctance to make abortion itself funny. Here we come to Moran, who has challenged us to laugh, and she does indeed provide the reader with more jokes about the abortion itself. She too tackles some of the more ideological questions surrounding abortion, including the concepts of the good abortions of raped teenagers and women whose lives are in danger and the bad abortions after IVF and of women who already have children. To lighten the mood, she compares this to Chris Morris's Brass Eye and its sketch on good and bad AIDS, a reminder that there is humor in the satire of these polarizing interpretations. She goes on to discuss other serious matters, such as her take on the sanctity of life argument, that the quality of life of the potential child must be taken into account, and on women's reluctance to speak openly about their experiences of abortions and how that impacts on legal ideological debates about abortion. When Moran comes to speak of her own procedure, she maintains her conversational and jovial style. On her first consultation with her existing gynaecologist and realisation that it is a Catholic hospital, she quips, I have just, in effect, asked the Pope for an abortion. Her research for a new doctor is described as the world's least fun Google search, and she describes the location of the clinic as an area that has that light suburban air of wife swapping and neat brothels run by bosomy women. There is a break from flippancy, though, for the description of the waiting room. 
Moran gives a brief account of the other women, focusing on one old woman in particular, who cries without making a sound. She has the air of a woman who hasn't told a soul and never will. There is a line then for Moran. She will not mock this woman's experience of abortion, but she treats it with respect. For Moran, it is only her own experience that is available for comedy. She compares her experience of the procedure itself with the surgical procedure after her first pregnancy, which ended in a miscarriage, where she was under anaesthetic for the first DMC, dilation and curatage. She was fully aware, sorry, she was fully awake for the abortion. The cervix is opened manually with some sort of ratchet. Then a speculum is inserted and they start to perform the abortion, which appears to be just smashing stuff up with a spoon. It's wincingly violent, like breaking the yolk of an egg with a chopstick, I think, doing the breathing I learned for labour, which is, of course, a very bad joke. As well as describing the violence of the procedure, Moran demonstrates how she uses humour as a method of self-distraction in this moment. The punctuation of this final sentence renders its meaning ambiguous, and every time I read it, I change my mind about what the bad joke is. Initially, I read it as the egg yolk analogy, but then I find that she could equally be calling attention to the irony of using Lamaze breathing exercises during an abortion. Either way, even a bad joke at this juncture shows that Moran can find humour in this experience, which takes away some of the reader's unease in this moment. She goes on to make two further jokes about the method of the procedure, comparing the vacuette to a household vacuum cleaner. The doctor then uses a vacuette to hoover my womb out, which is pretty much how you would imagine having the contents of your womb vacuumed out to feel like. In the months after, it makes me repeatedly demur from the purchase of a Black & Decker bus dust buster. The doctor turns the vacuum off. He then turns it on again and does one last little bit, like when you're doing the front room, finish, and then decide to give the sofa cushions a once-over while you're at it. This analogy of household cleaning thus normalizes what is seen as a very secretive and shameful aspect of one part of female bodily experience by comparing it to the domestic domain, a safe space for women in comedy. Moran also transforms herself from passive object to active subject, although I don't have time here to go into this placing of the female subject within the spheres of domestic cleaning and consumerism and obviously the, the issues with that. Moran's focus is on the internal physical experience, but also on the practitioners themselves. Her attitude towards the medical staff is ambivalent as she initially tries to understand their perspective. You want to become a doctor to help people. You look like humans have constantly disappointed you. After the procedure, however, there is a moment where the doctor inspects the contents of the dish um, and this shifts the portrayal of the clinicians. Intrigued by something, he calls his colleague over from the sluice. Look at that, he says, pointing. Ha ha, unusual, the other says. They both laugh before the dish is carried away and the gloves are peeled off and the cleaning starts. The day is now done. Appearing on the same page as Moran's vacuum cleaner jokes, the laughter of the medical staff is jarring. When Moran makes jokes about her own experience, it is empowering. When the doctors laugh at the contents of the dish, that power is taken away from her. She is denied knowledge of the joke, running through different possible reasons in her head. The very worst thought is, perhaps something was struggling to stay alive. Perhaps he's running out his last piece of luck as I lie here, feeling pale as paper on the outside and red and black on the inside like bad meat. That's the worst bit, the very worst bit. I wish these doctors would shut up. Entirely oblivious to Moran's presence in the room and by laughing at the product of the abortion, the doctors here make Moran the object of the joke. Moran concludes her chapter, back in control and confident in her decision. Given the subject matter, it seems odd to say that this is a happy ending, but it is. Both writers defy the stereotypes of how a woman is supposed to feel post-abortion. Pasco explains, People told me how I'd feel about my abortion. I was to expect regrets and tears and guilt and bad dreams, and perhaps I'm an awful person, but I was not sorry. I've been haunted, I have been haunted since, but the ghost is gentle and suggestive. Every year on my birthday, I do a little sum in my head to work out the unborn's age. I'm not racked with sobs. I'm not shaking my fist at the past. I did not make a mistake, or I did, but I was not wrong to abort my mistake. Similarly, Moran writes about the expected narrative that women's bodies do not give up their babies so easily. The heart will always remember. In fact, it's the opposite. Every time I sleep through the night, I'm thankful for the choice I made. When friends come round with their new babies, I'm hugely, hugely grateful that I had the option not to do this again. 
and that that option didn't involve me lying on a friend's kitchen table after the kids had gone to sleep, praying I wouldn't get an infection or hemorrhage to death before I got home. So in spite of their different circumstances, age, relationship status, and first versus fourth pregnancy, both writers are defiantly open about their experiences of abortion and their refusal to conform to the stereotype of the shameful and regretful post-abortion woman. Moran's text opens the door for women to laugh and share their own experiences, but is mindful to laugh with and not at these women. Where Pasco appears more reluctant to laugh about abortion in her book and in her stand-up comedy where she doesn't talk about it at all, she has more recently included her abortion as a storyline in her excellent BBC series, Out of Her Mind, from October 2020, where she plays Sarah Pasco, both presenter and protagonist. In episode three, My Life Is Over, that's my doorbell. I'm very sorry. Hopefully my fiancé will answer it and I can carry on. Ah, yay, welcome to Zoom conferences. Sorry. In episode three, My Life Is Over, Sarah plans a baby shower for her sister but not before asking the question from today's title, where was my party when I had an abortion? The baby shower takes place at appropriately named strip club Babes, which Sarah misreads as babies at 8am, uh, and the, and the uh, baby shower takes place at 8am on a Sunday morning. During the festivities, Sarah's mum enjoys a lap dance from a stripper in a diaper, and guests drink shots from baby head cups and baby bottles. Meanwhile, Sarah is visited by the ghost of her unborn child, now a teenager, and I've taken screenshots from the episode um, on the PowerPoint. Um, so he smiles and waves cheerfully at her from across the room before joining her in a bathroom stall to reassure her, I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here at all. As she apologises, but tells him that she does not regret her decision. It is a scene that brings poignancy to an episode that otherwise takes a tongue-in-cheek look at maternity, a highlight being the soundtrack of Pasco's own voice singing a series of different songs on motherhood, including lines such as, it's going to hurt like hell on the day that it happens. And motherhood is hard. No one ever tells you that. I've never felt so alone before the chorus of just another day of keeping someone else alive, all set to a jaunty pop beat. Aware that portraying a conversation with the imagined ghost from her teenage abortion was likely to be controversial, Pasco followed the advice if you're going to have someone playing an abortion, then you should choose an actor that everyone wishes was dead. Hence the casting of Jack Gleason, also known as Joffrey from Game of Thrones. That's certainly one way to mitigate audience discomfort, but with abortion still such a taboo in the UK where it is legal, let alone elsewhere in the world, I for one feel there is still a way to go before it will comfortably be the subject of our feminist, anti-patriarchy, relaxed earthy chuckles. And there are my references. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. That's been amazing to hear. Um, we'll introduce now Tom. Uh, Tom will present the paper, Country in Abortion Stigma in Contemporary Art, Activist Storytelling in Words and Image. Uh, Tom Nis is a Belgian graduate in art history, currently pursuing a PhD at Loughborough University. For many years, he combined working as an independent curator, cultural event organizer, and art writer with a part-time position as a coordinator with LUNA, the umbrella organization of abortion centers in the Dutch-speaking region of Belgium. In 2015, he was responsible for a highly acclaimed national awareness campaign about abortion stigma with six art photographers. Now his research focuses on visual artworks and exhibitions that deal with abortion and sexual and reproductive health and rights. The aim of his study is to explore how contemporary arts can play a part in country in abortion stigma. Tom, whenever you're ready. Um, yes, yeah, so first of all, thank you, uh, Adriana, for this introduction. Uh, also, thank you, Ben and Becky, um, for organizing this conference and to my co-panelists as well. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for your previous um, presentation and Carla for the upcoming one. Um, so yes, my uh, presentation will be a bit different in the sense that it will concern visual arts, but um, as it's not uncommon in visual art and contemporary art, language in speech as well as in writing often plays a certain role. And one might even say that a visual as such is or has a language of its own. Um, in any case, for this presentation, I have opted for a few examples that make use of this combination of text and image. 
Um, I also would like to mention that, uh, of course, I often talk about in my presentation as well as in my PhD about women's bodies, the women's movement, um, what not, but obviously um, we know that um, certain trans people, non-binary people, genderqueer people also have abortions. We should take that into account, um, which is important also that um, examples here all located, situated in the so-called global north um, for the, yeah, the, the sake of it, for the, because that was a bit easier here. Um, I firstly would like to briefly mention an, an, a recent initiative from 2017 that perfectly brings together visual and narrative art, um, in this case to address uh, pregnancy termination. Um, which is this one, uh, it is Comics for Choice, um, an anthology of illustrated abortion stories, histories and politics by different uh, US based uh, illustrators and comic books are in some uh, regions even called the ninth art form. Um, I think it's a wonderful book. Um, it has this great combination of personal stories, history, I'm very fond of it, I have to say. So, um, but for the first um, real case study that I will cover in depth, which is perhaps, which is the oldest in my presentation, perhaps also the best known one, um, I will go back to 1989, so in the late 80s, uh, to the US. Um, and you all know this image, I, I imagine or have seen it before. Um, it's made by Barbara Kruger, uh, simply called Untitled, Your Body is the Blood Battleground. And it was created for, originally, the posters and pamphlets for a women's march on Washington uh, in 1989. And it has all the features of Kruger's well-known uh, oeuvre. It's a clever blend of appropriated imagery from popular media with text um, in these typical uh, red blocks. Uh, and a white Futura uh, font. And below you can read the call for the march, um, which makes obvious what was at stake actually. So the march was organized by the organization, the National Organization for Women, endorsed by several other organizations. And the immediate cause was the case Webster versus Reproductive Health Service, the services in Missouri, which had been brought up to the federal Supreme Court and which would be ruled on 26th. April of that year. Um, there are some similarities with lots of things going on in the states currently. Um, cases brought up to the, to the Supreme Court to undermine Roe versus Wade, which makes, um, which is a federal ruling that makes abortion legal in, in the US. Uh, now that undermining of Roe versus Wade in 89 was backed by uh, then President George W.H. Bush. Bush senior, um, I must say. Uh, and justifiably, the protesters at the rally, um, which were over 300,000 in number, also turned their ire against the president. But from the White House, eventually no comment was given. Now, in the past, um, the artist Kruger had already made several other designs for the board as a team, but she was very committed to this one. And while artworks very often become functional, for instance, in the case of merchandising, um, or as illustrations in books and magazines and websites. Here the implementation was actually reversed. So Kruger um, first made the design uh, to function as a pamphlet and then turned it into an artwork of his own right, which was immediately bought by, uh, by the bras. Um, and it's currently uh, in their private museum in Los Angeles. You can see here the actual artwork that we created from that pamphlet. Um, sometimes Kruger often uses pronouns like I, you, your, um, and they can be somewhat confusing as one is never sure who is. Keep in mind, um, in a lot of art historical texts, um, a male is always uh, a viewer is always seen as male. Here the your 
explicitly address women, of course, because of that, because it was meant for that march, um, and whose bodies were a theater of ideological war. Um, so you have a division between the positive and negative sides of that uh, image that she, that she used. Um, and you can read this as a split between two fighting camps, progressive feminist thought versus traditional patriarchal views, um, or for or against female sexual rights, or pro-choice, pro-life. So that's all in that um, image. And like in, in, in a lot of other of Kruger's works, the, work, the words here uh, which are an observation of how women's physicality and sexuality are fields of contestation, complement the underlying visual representation of woman's head, selected from popular culture, clearly as a stereotype. A stereotype exists where the body is absent. That's no matter an individual's uh, woman's real physical outlook, the image represents all female bodies under siege. Now, what I think is particularly interesting about that uh, work and its design is that the artist revisited it for several other occasions. Um, I believe that type of afterlife is particularly interesting. So she made posters of it that were included in a New York uh, magazine, uh, The Village Voice, a year later. Um, which was this one, where you have the support legal abortion, birth control, and women's rights um, situated elsewhere on, on the image. Um, also for posters here, I like this picture because it um, contrasts, the, well, contrasts, it's, it complement, it complements, supplements the image above from the handmade tale that um, was then recently released. Um, and also as, a, as billboards, for instance, for the Wexner in, uh, Colombia, also in 1999. Yeah, in 1999 uh, and 1991, um, Kruger was invited uh, to for an exhibition in Warsaw in Poland. Um, Poland had just become, was just liberated from the communist regime um, and was turning more and more towards its Catholic Christian values as a response to that. And so the artist made a version of her poster uh, in Polish, um, stating the same text, but then in Polish translated, obviously, uh, to be distributed as a poster in the city of Warsaw. Um, now we all know that, well, you might know that the political tension in Poland about this issue never fully vanished. And I cannot expand on this here, but like last year, end of last year, um, we saw that the con conservative governmental parties of the country managed to make um, sure that abortion was almost completely abolished uh, through the Polish Constitutional Court, which led to um, all means of political activism in real life, online. Uh, and one of the actions amidst that amalgamation of deployed strategies was putting up that poster again. So um, after all these years, um, you could see the same poster uh, in Washo and in Chechen uh, again. And obviously um, another um, example of that afterlife is that a lot of protesters often use um, or refer to uh, Kluge's image uh, too. So my next example are from um, an artist called Alexandra Mir, um, which she created in 2005 for an exhibition in a gallery in New York. Um, and her unambiguous target um, at that time were uh, the sexual policies of President George Bush Jr. Um, and she once said, in an, uh, Mir said in an interview that um, this is the show that defeats all others. I never do politically explicit work, but I decided for once to do just that, to see what would happen. Um, and so for this show, uh, she adopted the, the persuasive strategies and marketing techniques often used by anti-abortion uh, organizations, as well as politicians in election campaigns 
just to get her point across. And she made six large posters as well as other promotional material, scarves, lighters, mugs, pocket knives, uh, sewing kits, even dental floss, um, <clears throat> which ha all had um, different types of messages printed on them. And this was one of that you can often see uh, that she made. It says keep abortion legal um, in a light blue and pink. Um, of course, referring to the typical slogan often used by other feminist organizations. Um, but here, obviously, um, in a sort of a color palette that, well, in a color palette that is obviously a reference to the, to the soft use that um, are used for babies' gender, uh, imbuing the design with a sort of a sentimentalism that often goes hand in hand with cultural phenomena around childhood. Um, and with this, uh, that sentimentalism, she wanted to uh, counter um, the placards with bloody depictions of dead fetuses, etc., that the anti-abortion movement often carried along and put up at street protests. Another of her designs in that show uh, was this one. Here we can clearly see uh, who she was referring to. Um, it is George Bush as a fetus floating in space. Um, that thing in itself, the, the, the floating in space, uh, is a reference uh, which is often made by feminist authors that um, the fetus becomes detached from the woman and um, is floating, seemingly floating in space. As one can see in the photo series made by Leonard Nilsson in 65 for, for um, Life magazine, um, you can see that. It was a, a, an amazing series. Um, we can talk a lot about it, but I will just skip it. Just say that Mir used that image uh, of Nielsen, um, put Bush's head on top of it. But what is very interesting for me exactly is the text underneath it, what would you do? Um, it echoes the popular slogan of evangelical Christians, what would Jesus do, often seen as a bumper sticker. And by substituting Jesus by the personal pronoun you, she actually creates a snow clone of this sentence um, in which, for which the imperative is turned to individual responsibility rather than a reliance uh, on religious beliefs. Um, for my next case, I will turn to the UK. Um, and thanks to a broad coverage specialized as well as in popular media, um, British artist Tracy Emmons' work in personal life um, have become well known. Uh, moreover, she has placed the idea of autobiography at the forefront of her career and has strategically um, sought exposure in the media. And in consequence, her name and identity now constitutes a persona. Now, the pitfall of this strategy is, of course, that Emmons' life and work are easily conflated in that fabrication or artistic intervention are often overlooked. So does she speak for herself by our art or in a more generalized way for all women? Uh, in any case, her work thus became repeatedly categorized as diaristic or confessional art, even though such classification can pose a bit of problems. Um, had some particular repercussions on her representation of female sexuality, heterosexuality, in this, in her case. Um, she often turned to female nudes um, in different media in a way that deviates from the traditional rendition of naked women by male artists. And in most of these works, a solitary naked female is portrayed, often in a lascivious pose, sometimes dressed only in high heels, often masturbating, um, in a rudimentary and um, drawing style. Now, the defining characteristic for Emin is always that inclusion of text um, informs our whole order. And the words in these cases seem to come from the model. Bestow that model with an authority that is often lacking in use by male artists. And as these short articulations are predominantly set in the first person, the presumption is often that all these works are self-portraits. Um, and her open position towards female sexuality in such works 
yeah, can be viewed as a sort of an expression of sexual liberation, sex positivity, as you will, um, which does not really concur with social conceptions of for instance, female chastity or reticence. Um, and Jennifer Doyle, uh, an author, associated the way in which Emin deals with problematic sex with what she calls a bad sex aesthetic. Um, Emin has also never shied away from visualizing unfortunate outcomes of sexual intercourse, which is important here. Um, a good example is this here, uh, terribly wrong, a rendering of a reclining figure um, with fluid dripping from between her raised legs and she might be urinating or bleeding or miscarrying. Uh, and in a similar vein, abortion regularly features in her work too. Uh, now, Emin has often spoken publicly about the two pregnancy terminations she has undergone. Um, and she wrote this quasi autobiographical novel, Strange Land, in which she also describes an abortion experience that did not go well. Uh, also lists the proper steps for dealing with an unwanted pregnancy as a complete chapter and counterpoint. Um, might also be worthwhile to point out that um, early on in 1999, already Emin also indicated that the real impetus to take her career as an artist seriously was in fact her uh, first abortion. Um, now, um, what we do see in, in or here in a lot of uh, Emin's works, and especially in this video, how it Feels. How it feels is a video that shows Emin revisiting the places where she had uh, her, abor her abortion, where she went to repose and think about the whole experience, which is clearly a very um, emotionally charged um, thing to, that she did, made a video about it. Um, and with this video, she actually confirms the kind of response that is commonly expected of a person who's had an abortion on the face of it. She communicates that in her case, motherhood was finally a physical possibility, but not viable because of the situation she was in. Uh, and while we might initially understand this as a negative event, the artist ultimately makes the viewer realize that abortion is perhaps necessary exactly because of her, her position at that time, which was loaded with psychological turmoil. And Carrie Purcell, um, who uh, does studies about uh, abortion stigma calls this non-negative speech rather than speaking positively about abortion you speak non-negatively about it for instance a sentence like um, oh i did not feel bad at all it's not necessarily a positive um description it but yeah it's a non-negative one as they say now, the confessional name of Emmons works about abortion, especially this video, relates to a strategy that sociologists, reproductive justice activists, etc., consider to be a useful response to the stigmatization of persons who have had abortions and of providers. And this strategy is, open, is to open up the conversation and thus to challenge the taboo. When people have talked about their personal abortion stories in a private situation to the media or in public forums, this has helped to bring the debate in the open, even if the experience was a negative one. Um, you also have to take into account that abortion stigma is not visible to others, um, but it instigates negative reactions in some, and women who have had abortions tend to internalize that stigma as a coping mechanism, are prone to self-stigmatization too. So speaking about your abortion um, is a good thing. And while it's currently um, a sort of well, trend is perhaps a, a, a badly chosen word, but it's something, it, it's something that you see more and more uh, that has been taken up by a lot of initiatives. Um, so the tendency of women to conceal the fact that they have had an abortion, which can make it more difficult for women to reconcile with the experience or even stay silent. Well, such a quandary can be resolved by such initiatives uh, to normalize the practice by encouraging people to speak about their abortion. Um, 
obviously one can never um, force people to speak, but when they do, um, it is always a good thing. Uh, and this is perhaps also what a lot of these artists have done, uh, and Emin and, 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 and in particular. So thank you uh, to the three of you. You've, uh, I mean, I've learned so much with your presentations and I, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna keep on talking. I'm just gonna start the Q&A. And I just want to remind the, um, everyone who is listening, uh, please just, uh, you can raise your hands or type in any questions that you have on the chat box. Um, so I want to start kind of like linking uh, all the, the three presentations. Um, so, you know, you've all presented uh, uh, women or protagonists that count their um, self experiences. Um, and then, you know, somehow it trespasses the self narrative and becomes something more, uh, something political, maybe conscious or unconsciously. But um, so I, I guess it's maybe a reflection uh, that I want to like open up, but um, in which way do you think, you know, these personal accounts are necessary uh, in society for a shift in the way society sees issues such as this? And it's a question for all the three of you, whoever wants to start. Um, I guess I can go first. Um, I feel like um, this is, it's not specific to abortion. Um, and in fact, Adriana, it links in very nicely with your project, um, uh, which again, is still on sort of reproductive issues and those sorts of things. But I think generally um, part of, and actually Tom, I'm really glad that you mentioned um, what I didn't mention in mine, which is that my books only talk about um, cisgender women. And actually that is, if I were to level a criticism at both Pasco and Moran, it's that they don't really talk about, so the evolution of a female body, but there's no question about trans women in that, which I think, but I think that definitely women, and I don't know how to say the word with an X in, but all women, um, we don't necessarily share our stories or, or the fact that it, you know, the idea that if you are going to share it, it can only be between women because it's a private women's issue, like you were saying at the beginning of, of your paper, Carla. And actually, I think that's absolute, and I swore in my paper, so I feel like I can swear again now, but that's absolute bullshit. We, we need to be sharing these experiences. It's not that women belong in the private sphere and that this is such a fundamental, yes, Alice, this is such a fundamental part of human experience. I mean, for goodness sake, 51% of the world that's the majority so yeah and I just think that empowerment comes from speaking up and like you know it, like your final point Carla from from Ernaud's book like it's it's just it's so vital I can't tell you why because it just fund I feel so fundamentally that it is that I don't even know that it just is you know Um, I also would like to add that um, in sociology, um, especially medical sociology, like abortion stigma is a field that has been unresearched up until now. So that started taking off in the 1990s, early 2000s. Currently, um, the whole notion of speaking out um, of one's abortion, about abortion, um, is under very close scientific academic scrutiny. And some studies, really good ones, have been published that that really does um, help to counter the stigma um, as such, which is also why so many initiatives are happening currently in that kind of um, sphere, taking that notion further. Um, so I just want to point out that yes, that necessity that everyone can feel um, is now more and more uh, being confirmed by um, academia nowadays. So that's just something I would like to point out. 
Yeah, no, no, I don't think it's like a simple answer, but... Um, um, yeah. um, if I could just, like, you're definitely right, Carla, and I mean, I'm, my my paper is one hundred percent political, like it absolutely is. Um, and I, I like and as I wrote those, as I said those words, I felt a bit like a fraud. Um, but I was, I yeah, I I was trying to not too much push my own personal views. But I mean, there's no way that I can ever be devoid of my own personal connection with the topic. The reason I research it is because of my my interest in it and my own political views. But um, but I, I think we need. We, I think what I when I said about the sort of the example I use as the political and Colose's work, I think that it's maybe we need more in one what I would term academic work, which gives us balance because it, it feels to me that that the representation of pro-life arguments and and I think we live in a world where we should be able to hear both sides of the argument but again maybe it's because of my own personal bias I feel that there isn't well I've, I've struggled to find work that is from that political side that isn't as polarizing if that's the right word if you know what I mean yeah so the things that I do not study um are films for instance um, and we do have now a wave of films, uh, serious films, but also comedies that tackle uh, abortion issues as such uh, in a very positive way. Um, however, um, as a reaction, I, I think, um, against that, a lot of very pro-life, so as we can call it like that, anti-abortion films have been made too, um, expressly stating their aversion of Hollywood, etc. So it's very often Christian orientated. Um, well, it, it has this undercurrent of, of, of Christianity for sure in the States mostly. Um, so in film, I can say yes, in art, yeah, sure. Well, yeah, it, it does happen. I do want also want to say that we often focus on the polarizing, so pro, it's all pro or against, but um, the feelings and abortion experience generates, but also that whole debate can change because of that experience is far more complex than simply for or against. And so polls uh, for or against abortions, for me personally, they, they don't say much. Because in, in a lot of, I've heard a lot of women say like, yeah, abortion, I think it's necessary, but not for me. Or yeah, something that is more in between, complex. But of course that doesn't uh, sound good um, in sound bites on social media, on media in general. So it's all this whole polarizing thing nowadays. We also focus always on the, negative side when it comes to abortion rights for instance now that Roe versus Wade perhaps will be undermined uh, in the states uh, in autumn but there are also positive stories like a lot of conservative Latin America countries are now opening up their abortion laws so it's all it's more balanced than that but uh, but I can understand yeah this discourse in the media is often I don't throw or against, and that's it. Unfortunately, yeah. Um, um if I could just say, because well, just very briefly, my my PhD work is not actually on contemporary writing at all. Um, I've I've basically done this because I enjoyed. Well, I wanted to be part of the seminar, so I found a way to shoehorn. Uh, Jean Carochet in via L'Evénement and then I wanted to be part of this I thought well I'm just going to write about something else that I think is interesting and fits the bill um, but a lot of the novels from the Belle Epoque um, were more clearly anti-abortion um, but then I mean when we're thinking about the first decade of the 20th century and, and where we are now in terms of larger feminist you know, feminist voices and, the fem you know, the feminist movement back then was very pro-maternity because they were using the figure of the mother as a way to then get women rights. You know, we need to give women rights because they are creating the children for the future of the nation. Um, but no, there was a lot of 
anti-abortion stuff. And what I haven't been able to track down or pinpoint is of my two female authored texts that I have, Camille Père and Jeanne Carouchet, whether they themselves had experienced abortions, because I that is something that would, you know, they're very much, these are fictionalized. In fact, Camille is a gender ambiguous name anyway. So, you know, um, she was a woman, but whether or not she was using the, you know, that the fact that her gender ambiguous first name gave her a bit more freedom with her writing. Um, but yeah, so definitely the period that I work on the, well, Tom, what you were saying in terms of the ambiguous, I'm finding a lot more ambiguous novels actually from that period where there's, you know, certain characters it works out for, but other characters, you know, particularly the Fizzers d'Ange and the botched abortions and the, you know, disposal of the body afterwards to prevent the the abortionists from being found out like there's some really horrible stuff in there that makes the whole abortion thing seem horrible but then there's little glimmers of like oh but this woman she actually she was fine and it was a it was the right decision for her so there's there's some really interesting stuff okay uh thank you um there are a couple of comments on the chat box one is is, is a comment is a suggestion for Catherine's. i'm not gonna read it because i'm just aware of time uh but just i want you to know that it's there and then uh amalina she says she has a question for Catherine. Thanks, Adriana, and thank you all. That was that was so interesting. Um, it's a really, really thought-provoking panel. Um, I have I have a couple of questions for, for Catherine, if that's okay. Um, the, the, the first one is is about the, um, one of the comments on the back cover of Catelyn Moran's book where I think it said naughtily funny and I thought I mean that 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 word naughty naughtily I mean it's so often used with regard to um, female comedians who are talking about sex um, and you know it's obviously problematic um, but I wondered whether you felt that the Pasco and Moran play that up a little bit at all. I mean, I haven't read Pasco's work, but um, you know, it's my sense that Caitlin Moran does does kind of like play into that kind of oh, this is a little bit naughty. And I, I just wondered if you, if you wanted to say something about that and whether you felt that 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 was in any way kind of problematic or, or limiting. Um, that's my first question, and then my second question, um, if I if I may. Um, is just to ask you a little bit more about the idea of laughter as a kind of a, a response and as a form of resistance to the to the patriarchy. You were sort of talking about how Moran's laugh, laughing at herself, but also laughing, you know, as a way to laugh at the patriarchy. Um, and I wondered whether whether you felt that, that laughter. I mean, is is laughter a kind of as a form of resistance? Is it a kind of privilege of, of white feminism? That's my second question. That's an excellent question. That's a really, really excellent question. Um, and one I fear I won't be able to give an adequate response to. Um, but if I, I'll start with the with the naughty, the naughtily funny. Um, I think you're right. She definitely does play into that. I think I think Moran's background is really interesting. Like she she wrote her first novel at something like 16 and has this really interesting backstory about this this house of like nine children that her mother had and had this kind of wild that she she had a tv show I've forgotten what it's called now but it's about her her growing up in Wolverhampton and like this mad existence she had and I think she kind of is she's forged a career for herself where she is kind she is a character um in the way that she she writes so not only has she written I think three three books now, including How to Build a Girl and More Than a Woman. I think those are the three non-fiction books she's written. Um, but also in her journalistic style and when she appears on interviews, podcasts, those sorts of things. I think she, yeah, there's very much like a, I'm a funny woman and this is how I'm going to approach it. And I'm going to talk about sex and all those things that you think we can't talk about, we're going to talk about. And I, I, I complete, I respect it. I do because I, I wish that it wasn't such a big deal, but I think that she, there is certainly like a, a knowing way that she does it. Um, and yeah, the, the, that review is from stylist which I'm not overly familiar with, but the name suggests to me it's a women's magazine. Does anyone know? Is that, is that, what it, is that right? 
Um, and I wonder if that kind of, oh no, it's not, sorry, it's the independent. It was the independent that said that. And I think, yeah, so that's, mm, yeah, no. Um, it's definitely interesting. And I think with Pascoe's, it's less that. Um, but I think as well, because she's using the frame of the, 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 scient the science and, you know, which is, and in her, she gives a really interesting, um, one of the three introductions to the book, she talks about how, when we've looked at the evolution of the body, it's almost exclusively the male body, which is why she wanted to do that. So it's almost like she's trying to claim a male domain through doing that. Um, but yeah, um, laughter is a response and resistance to the patriarchy. And is that a privilege of white women? Um, because obviously these are both white cis women that I, that I am speaking about their work um, and heterosexual women as well. Um, I think it's, yes, there is probably something to that, absolutely. Um, I didn't have time in my paper to talk about Pasco interviews she's given about why she hasn't spoken about her abortion in her stand-up. Um, and because that that seems like the, you know, the more natural possibly to an outsider, you know, well, why doesn't she talk about in her stand-up? You know, Tiff Stevenson, these other comedians, they're talking about it in their stand-up. Why does she, is she ashamed of it? And she said that it's, it's because it's such a complex issue. She feels like when she's doing a stand-up routine, sometimes you say things before it's fully formed, whereas to be able to write about it, she can really reflect and make sure she's dealing with it. Because even though both women, both writers talk about, you know, I don't feel ashamed, they both acknowledge the fact that actually it's definitely, it's a very complex issue. And there are women who have, there are people who have had abortions who are going to, not want to laugh about it and you know she gives an ex the example of rape jokes um and why she says that with a rape joke at the end of the like well, ideally we would live in a world where you could make rape jokes more confident comfortably because the real issue is not it's that the real issue is that rape is not reported that rape still happens that that young people are not really educated on what consent really means um and so she talks about if you are going to make a rape joke, and I feel like the abortion jokes kind of fit a similar place here. It's got to be a really good joke. Um, and you've got to be aware that you are going to hurt, like you are going to trigger people. And it is a really serious issue and that people are going to have a reaction. And that it's not, we're not in a place yet where it can be comfortably done. And, and I think that I haven't really addressed what you were saying in your question I don't think but I think it's an excellent question and something that we probably we need to address and think about more when we are thinking about just abortion and contemporary popular culture in um, general. Thank yeah you. Uh, yeah that's great um well I'm really sorry uh but the other panel are waiting already so I'm afraid we need to finish this session but the conversation has been interesting and hopefully we can continue it like by email and some interesting connections can develop from here uh so I'm just gonna say thank you and I'm gonna say bye as well to uh, all the participants so um I am um... To audio describe myself, I am a white woman um, with blonde curly hair and big glasses uh, and I am just sat in a room, a very nice room that isn't my room in Finland. Um, so I will begin um, my presentation today with some narrativity theses and the idea that we mediate and understand lived experiences through narrative structures owes much now to the instrumental work of Jerome Bruner. He argues that human beings understand live time as a narrative that allows us to integrate potentially meaningless and disparate events into a purposeful and coherent whole or a life story. He argues that narrative provides a framework through which we experience, organize and define who we are. And Paul Ricard, too, argues for the interconnectivity of life and narrative in our construction of what he calls narrative identity. He argues that we dynamically implot our lived experiences into readable contexts through which the world achieves some sense of coherence, meaning and order. 
Through these stories of the world, we recognize our own selves in time and place as agents of narrative events, both how we came to be in the present, but also how we will be in a world that is still to come. The role of narrative, therefore, is not only informative, but instrumental. We come into being through narrative structures. Narrative is not only how we understand the world, these arguments suggest, but how we experience it in the first place. And the question these narrativity theses commonly raise is this, what happens to the self without narrative? When our narrative capabilities are impaired or decline, do we no longer have an identity? Do we cease to be human? Do we cease to be at all? And for many, the answer to that question is that we do. Many arguments follow that as we lose our narrative capabilities, we become de-storied and thus cease to exist as persons. Life is narrative and narrative is life. And Alzheimer's disease has become perhaps the paradigmatic example of de-storied and dehumanized selves. This is where we find examples of people reduced to vegetables, the zombies and other metamorphoses of the living dead, but also to children and to a second childhood. With conditions like Alzheimer's disease and other dementia-related diseases that affect memory, language, and awareness, the ability to narrate coherent stories is understood by conventional standards, and these are not necessarily ones I agree with, but by conventional standards to suffer, with a consequential effect on conceptions of identity and selfhood. Who or what remains when their narrative disappears? And I will attempt to answer this question firstly, or to engage with this question, by challenging some of the conventions surrounding narrative identity. That is, that identity is not simply individual. And the narrative identity of a subject is not a purely internal phenomenon. But this question is also important. It's not the right slide at all. Uh, this question is also important in another respect. Because by challenging the ways in which we see narrative identity, we also question how illness comes to affect others, how it might be constructed as a communal experience. So the idea that narrative identity is not an individual or an independent phenomenon is important for understanding how the self persists over time and in different spaces, even and including once a person has lost their cognitive function or even died. Our stories, and thus our narrative identities and narrative selves, are not individual, but the product of, an in, of interconnections and exchanges between subjects and objects over time and in different places. Even if we are to accept the notions of narrative identity, we must open it up to allow space for the entanglements of others within our own stories, and hence to a certain alterity of the self. We should think more of a narrative web in which one's own identity comes into being through entanglements with others. When an individual loses their capacity to tell stories of their life, or indeed if they never had such an ability in the first place, which is Strawson's argument, the web of narratives remains such that the person continues to exist within the narratives of others, albeit not in the same way, because their labor in the process might have changed, but they still exist because they're still a part of other people's narratives. So by thinking of identity or selfhood as a web through which we come into being with others, we can reframe the challenges presented by Alzheimer's disease to constructions of identity and self. And this is something Lars Christa Haydn considers when he argues that storytelling is always a collaborative enterprise, becoming more deeply entangled as dementia progresses so that stories are often co-told or scaffolded with the help of others, particularly in family settings, but also in good healthcare facilities too, collaborative storytelling has a remedial quality in compensating for one person's advancing dementia by using prompts or repairing the given narrative or by contributing to the story as a joint activity. The self that results from narrative is not therefore to be found in any individual story, but rather emerges in the relations between narratives, 
or in the act of narrating itself. As Huvrenen and Watanabe, Bilding or Haydn argue, if we move towards understanding narrative as a verb or an adjective rather than a noun, we can envision a self that communicates and is constituted with the help of narratives and storytelling. And is this idea of the self as emerging through the exchange of narratives in a web, as it were, that I want to discuss today? It is an idea that is clearly enacted in a number of dementia fiction narratives, and particularly one that I'll discuss briefly here. The novel uh, Anne Prayas's La Reine Neuve, or The Naked Queen, published in 2003, is a fictional family narrative told from multiple perspectives over multiple time frames and in several different genres. Giulietta Padovani, oh, I've done it again. I'm on a panel with two Italians and I didn't check the pronunciation, so I'm really sorry. <laughs> didn't even think about that today. Anyway, sorry. Giulietta, the family matriarch, presents um, these little absences or loss of awareness and eventually the family assume caregiving responsibilities. A diagnosis is never given in the novel, but a number of what are now conventional narrative strategies for fictional works of Alzheimer's disease are used. For example, Giulietta was a former prolific author producing one book every two years for 50 years. So there's this precedent that she is or always was this highly narrative individual. She was a professional storyteller. Um, and her dementia is therefore textually represented as the disintegration of the narrative. Uh, these ellipses, an obvious search for the right word, gaps and absences and so on, that perpetuate many of the common dementia fiction tropes. The reader is often aware of situations or subjects that escape the narrator's realization, such as when Julieta's first person voice tells the reader about a woman called Loretta, who always cries, but we as readers know to be the narrator's daughter. But Julieta's obvious confusion is represented as only one part of the story, and her narrative identity is multivocal and therefore preserved to some extent through the novel. Conveniently enough, Julieta has seven children Julius, Antoine, Pierre, Frederic, Elsa, Marietta, and Loretta. And so, conveniently enough, this caregiving roles are shared into daily routines. Each child takes care of their mother for one day a week. And the novel receives a further perspective when Marietta discovers her mother's diaries. Fragments of Julietta's written memoirs are interspersed into the story, giving a temporally dislocated but narratively coherent perspective of Julietta many years earlier. Again, something of the convention in narratives of dementia and Alzheimer's disease, the story poses a number of mysteries that are largely resolved through the crisscrossing of stories, timeframes and genres, particularly helps when they find these diaries. And once a week, the children meet to share their, their experience of experiences of their mother. And at these meetings, Julieta comes to exist through their stories. At the center of every scene, uh, I thought I had changed that. Mm -hmm. At the center of every scene that evoked or tried to interpret was Julieta, the emaciated naked queen. So as the narrative continues around Julieta, she comes to be through a dynamic process that is not found in any single story, neither her own nor one of her children's, but amongst the entanglements of different narrative threads. And so, <clears throat> This narrative responds to the first point that I wanted to make. Uh, I did put it down. There we go. Um, Julieta comes into being through a multitude of narratives. Her identity is not the product of an individual construct, but comes into being through intersecting stories and voices. And it therefore has a perpetuity or a durability that transcends the individual voice alone. Julieta's identity her life story does not disappear as her narrative falters, but rather is transposed and transformed within the stories of others. And of course, this is a vulnerable position to be in, but it's also a potentially valuable one in the sense that we see how Julieta continues to be 
through the stories of others. And to return to the question I asked earlier, who or what remains when the narrative disappears? The answer is, of course, that the other narratives remain and that the individual doesn't disappear from these. She remains within the entanglements of other people's narratives. So our entanglements in other people's stories, memories, identities and selves and the porosity of these boundaries means that dementia reconfigures the organization of narrative structures. But it reinforces these entanglements by demonstrating how another's stories are interwoven with our own and as a part of our own. And it's not just Julietta who is constructed in this way. Every character in the novel is a composite of the multiple identities and narratives that move between subjects, times and places. What becomes apparent in the narrative is not the waning power of the individual who is affected by dementia, but rather how her disappearance, her memory loss, and her subsequent loss of stories will directly affect the children. Like the characters in her novels, Julietta's children begin to question their own existence as they are effaced from her memories. Without Julietta, the novel seems to ask, what will become of them? And this raises some new questions about the social implications of illness and disease from a narrative perspective. Indeed, who is ill? Julietta or the whole family? Julietta's illness has an effect upon the rest of the family, upon the network of narratives within which she is already tied up. And this is something that is often overlooked in experiences of illness and disease, but has important implications for thinking about care and consequence as a collective or communal phenomenon throughout and even after illness. If the subject exists as a product of their relations to others, is the person ill as an individual or as part of a collective? And this is not to suggest that others suffer in the same way when the subject is ill, but that suffering extends beyond the individual. And we think about this often in the context of death and the concomitant grief, which is a relational response to the loss of another person. But it's a, it is often neglected in experiences of illness. And so the question I want to ask now in concluding is this, how are others affected by an experience of illness? If the novel seems to confirm the idea of a collaborative storytelling, that each individual exists as the sum of the others, so that a narrative loss is a communal experience, then how are the ch children also entangled in the experience of Julietta's illness? In La Renouge, the children are profoundly affected by the experience of their mother's dementia. Their relationships are defined, redefined, by their interactions with the illness and consequently with one another. Um, although she should be uniting them, the common mother separated them, enclosing them in their silence. Like an uninvited guest who managed to slip in amongst them to take their place, to corrupt the relationship that united them. Julieta's illness forces a narrative silencing between the children that simultaneously separates them and unites them. Her illness is not a purely subjective phenomenon, but a profoundly intersubjective one and it extends beyond the reach of the individual subject, permeating the boundaries of space, time, and subjectivity. We often take illness as a singular experience that occurs in opposition to health, but this problematic dualism overlooks multiple factors, including the ways in which both illness and health are fluid and ambiguous ways of being in the world. Uh, thank you. Ooh a lot of those. Uh, I'll end there and apologies for uh, <laughs> some technical and pronunciation errors <laughs> on this Saturday afternoon.